Kyle. Um, let me just check if we are already online. Just leave some comments if you can hear me well, if you can see me well. And we are starting. Let's give it a 30 seconds more. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mike. I'm the co-founder of the Blackthorn AI. And it's great pleasure meeting you all and hosting this event. Thank you for your time. Thank you for coming. We're the Blackthorn AI, your host, and um, this is the AI for Pharma and Biotechnologies Conference. Like a little presentation for our company. We're the research and development company and it's our third event already. The records of previous two you can find on our YouTube channel. If you have not subscribed yet, feel free to do that. We will add more um, events hopefully soon. It's the first time we're hosting live on YouTube, so I hope that everything goes smooth. Um, we're not going to discuss a lot of theory and faraway future, but we want to bring you practice applied science and examples of how AI helps the industry. Uh, the structure of our event is following that every speaker has a speech of 20, 30 minutes. Uh, the first speaker will have actually a bit longer speech, but they'll present him a little bit later. And after every speaker, we have a 10 to 15 minutes Q&A session. So you will be able to give your question to the speaker and he will answer you on this live stream. Write your questions, please, to the YouTube chat. We will read them all. We'll try to answer as many as possible. About our schedule today, we have started right now and our first speaker will be Joshua Broid. Joshua is a senior AI ML solutions architect at Amazon Web Services. And he's going to talk about the accelerating machine learning and life sciences on AWS. Our second speaker is uh, Andrew Satz, the co-founder of EVQLV Inc. And he is an applied AI researcher. He's going to talk about how, um, about applying AI to drug discovery and development. After that, we have at 12.15 PM Eastern time, the third speaker, and actually it's our bonus speaker, Dmitro Krasnenko. He is the head of the laboratory of epigenetics, PhD in genetics. And also, he is a part of our team. He's a research lead at Blackthorn AI. And our last fourth speaker is the CEO of our company and founder, uh, Alexander, or Alex uh, Hurbich. He is going to talk about cutting edge drug discovery and why your game changer product could fail. So let's switch to our first speaker, Joshua Broid. Joshua is a senior ML social solutions architect from Amazon Web Services. Uh, if he would like to tell a little, a little bit more about himself, he will do it during his presentation. So let's welcome Josh. Thanks, Mike. Uh, it's great to meet everybody. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, what I wanted to discuss, uh, and uh, what I wanted to discuss, sorry, I'm trying to figure out how to change my slides. There we go. Uh, uh, first, what I wanted to do, um, for those who are not familiar with Amazon Web Services, um, uh, AWS for uh, a number of years has been helping uh, and working with life science companies uh, and startups to, in, to migrate and thrive in the cloud more broadly. And I wanted to discuss um, more specifically how AI ML uh, is being leveraged by healthcare. And in, and in this talk, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about life science uh, companies. Um, 
I, uh, as I mentioned, as, as Mike mentioned, I'm an AI ML specialist solutions architect. Uh, I work directly with healthcare and life science companies for thinking about uh, and building AI ML uh, applications, as well as how they are uh, integrated with uh, other uh, larger enterprise applications. What I wanted to discuss, uh, what I'm showing here, by the way, is this, this is this is just a selection of global life science uh, and genomics customers across the value chain. Uh, who are working with AWS or have deployed uh, on AWS. I'm going to discuss a number of these particular examples uh, as in specific use cases in a few slides. Before doing that, though, I did want to first mention, uh, because it kind of provides context of how we see life science companies who are leveraging AI ML, uh, I wanted to discuss the AWS ML stack. Uh, and I'm showing here a diagram of how this works. This is a ben essentially a visualization of the different ways machine learning and artificial intelligence can be used by uh, life science uh, and healthcare companies, and even outside of those industries as well. The top layer are AI services. These are pre-trained models that are hosted by AWS and can be leveraged via a simple API call. The key advantage of these services is that they allow you to quickly and easily use machine learning models without having to build them yourself. Instead, you can just pass your data to them, get back your result, and then your application can uh, move on with what needs to be done. So for example, if we look at Comprehend Medical, Amazon Comprehend Medical can be used for extracting ICD-10 codes, RxNorm codes, now even SNOMED codes, and you just pass your unstructured medical text to it, you get back the result. The key value proposition to, to just reiterate is that you can use these services without having to build AI ML applications yourself. It's just an API call. So developers can leverage them uh, with minimal uh, ML background if they wanted to. The opposite side is the ML frameworks and infrastructure, which allows you to build, train, deploy your own machine learning models where you control everything about the underlying infrastructure. Uh, this essentially allows you to build your ML models, but you also have to then maintain and manage that infrastructure. In between these two is the ML services, which comprises largely SageMaker. SageMaker allows you to build, train, and deploy your own models with your own data, but uh, allows you to, uh, but essentially SageMaker then manages the underlying infrastructure for you. Data scientists then can focus on building models and not having to essentially uh, manage EC2 instances. I'm, I'm going to discuss a little bit more, but this just provides background because we, what we see, and this has become a very powerful combination in life sciences, is that you can pick and choose which of these you need to use in different uh, applications. And indeed, you can mix and match as needed. So for example, if you have texts coming in in the form of PDFs, you don't have to build an OCR engine. You can just use Textract and then pass the results to your own custom model, let's say using SageMaker. So to highlight this, I want to discuss three trends that I have seen um, in the context of uh, life science customers uh, who are leveraging AWS for machine learning. And the three trends that I'm going to discuss are basic science at scale. This is essentially how can uh, pharma companies do their science, uh, including basic research, but at scale uh, using AWS. The second trend that I'm going to discuss is how can uh, how can you how can you do better document processing and search, uh, essentially in the context of enterprise search. It's very common that uh, that healthcare and life science uh, companies have lots of documents coming in, but it's not clear how to turn that into actionable insight. And the third uh, topic that I'm going to discuss, uh, the third trend is automation and semi-automation. And by the way, I'm gonna, the way I'm going to discuss this is I'm just going to present a few customer examples in each of these sections. In the uh, video description that's going to be post, that's going to be on YouTube, I'll, continue, I'll contain a link. I'll have links to each of these so you can choose if you want to read more about them, hear from the customers themselves. I'll have links to all of this in the video description. The first trend that I want to focus on is basic science at scale. And I'm going to present some examples of this. This first example comes from Moderna. 
And the key problem that they are facing is that when designing mRNA-based therapies, uh, for example, in the context of the COVID vaccine, but in many others now, there can be multiple RNA sequences and structures that in theory can be produced, but that space, that search space, space is gigantic. It's not possible to synthesize and test every single potential construct. So a key problem that's, that was, that's faced from a machine learning perspective is given this very large space, choosing which construct to build and test uh, is a high priority. And you have to choose which of these uh, to do. And the factors of this is obviously you want a construct that's effective, but it also has to be the most stable and easily to chemically develop. The key impact of this is that it improved turnaround time, increased mRNA quality, and decreased costs. And again, a, a, a theme I want to emphasize is that AI here is allowing for a much more rapid uh, basic science at scale. And a key point here that I want to emphasize is that scientists are into, are integrated with this AI. It's not a pure just AI algorithm. Scientists are doing their work leveraging AWS infrastructure and also leveraging um, uh, AI in that context. I, here also I want to note a point, which is they're using EC2 spot instances, which allow them to essentially spin up infrastructure as needed at a lower cost. The next example that I wanted to discuss also in the context of uh, basic sciences comes from Relay Therapeutics. The problem that they are facing, that they faced, is that uh, when seeing which molecules might inhibit a protein, which I'm schematically showing in this diagram, you have a docking engine that performs docking of small molecules in a large molecule. Searching that space also can be uh, very complex and doing this at scale can be uh, extremely difficult uh, because you need essentially a lot of compute. What Relay Therapeutics and their goal is essentially to filter down potential molecule candidates to 100 or 200 compounds that are most likely to bind the biological target. What I, the way I'm showing this here schematically is you have small molecule candidates. Some of these, for example, the green one has a very high score. Others like the square would have a low score. What Relay Therapeutics was able to do is leverage EC2 and AWS Batch to scale up to a, a 10 billion molecules that can be computationally screened for fitting the binding site. And this allows them to spin up up to, let's say, 100,000 cores in, in their particular use case and can, can be completed within 24 hours. This is a huge, uh, this is a, a prime example, I would say, of uh, basic science at scale because you're essentially scaling your docking engine uh, to now scale up to uh, essentially arbitrarily large workloads. And importantly, I want to emphasize these cores are then can auto scale so that you can scale up when you need and then scale down when you don't need the, them to be used, which saves on costs as well, as well. The impact here is that, as I just mentioned, you can easily scale to the required number of CPUs for each virtual screen. Their estimated cost reduction was by 50%. And importantly, from a scientific perspective, uh, Relay Therapeutics said that uh, noted that this had an increased hit rate compared to the, uh, a common alternative, which is just a purely experimental high throughput screen. The next example that I wanted to note comes from Celgene. Uh, this is in the context of analyzing images of cancer cells, which the images may include uh, both normal as well as tumor cells. And it's extremely laborious to label these either by hand or um, uh, image, uh, older image uh, uh, analysis algorithms will frequently misclassify uh, and mislabel the cells. So the solution that Celgene uh, uh, converged on was leveraging Amazon SageMaker and Apache MXNet within the context of SageMaker for building and training these models. So essentially by leveraging SageMaker for training the models, you can now have deep learning models that are deployed on SageMaker and allow for uh, higher accuracy labeling of the different cells within uh, the images. From a scaling perspective, the impact here is that they can they can scale up to the required number of CPUs for each virtual screen. And this particular analysis was also important uh, for uh, better toxicology predictions. 
again, I want to emphasize just to kind of summarize this particular section. Uh, when you think of basic sciences, whether that's docking or image analysis of cancer cells or optimizing constructs in the context of Moderna, but really you can, so the lesson of this is any scientific problem, when you think about how can this scale, I need not to, I don't want to do this just on one computer, but I need to do this on, you know, 100,000 instances. AWS provides the ability to do this. You can bring your own code, you can bring your own images if you want to, and scale up and scale out uh, those uh, scientific uh, experiments. The next trend that I've seen uh, that I want to discuss is intelligent document processing and search. And you might kind of ask, well, what does this have to do with the context of basic sciences? But I want to provide an example that comes from Gilead. And before discussing, I want to actually note context here, which is what I've seen, and I think that you know anyone in the audience uh, probably will identify, is that when you're doing scientific research, you spend a lot of time searching for things, looking for things. This is true not just in scientific research, but really in any job. You're spending a lot of data looking for things. Um, you might be looking for a particular, uh, uh, a particular piece of information that may be buried within many papers. Or you may just even be looking for what floor is IT located on. The ability to uh, scale search and do search properly and efficiently is essentially a multiplier and allows your uh, anyone in your company to do their job better. This example comes from Gilead. Gilead leveraged Kendra as well as other of the AI ML services to bring data together from many different enterprise systems and allow for quick, efficient search. To dig a little deeper in this, their particular use case is to bring data together from different enterprise systems across essentially the entire organization. This includes regulatory compliance, as I'm showing here, also supply chain, manufacturing. The goal is to get better, better insight. And I want to emphasize, allow people to do their jobs better by searching um, uh, in a more efficient fashion. The solution here leverages uh, Amazon Kendra. Kendra is uh, an AI ML service that allows for enterprise search. Essentially, you can connect it to your documents. Uh, Kendra comes with a number of built-in connectors to many different sources. Kendra will then ingest those documents, and then you can start asking, I want to emphasize natural language questions of your data. Even if a person has no technical background, they don't have to ask questions via like SQL or something like that. They just type in their question, uh, you know, questions like, you know, to give simple examples, what are symptoms of diabetes? Uh, and then Kendra will come back with the answer as well as locations of uh, uh, which documents have this data. I want to also emphasize that this is not just using Kendra out of the box. Gilead is also using Textract to extract data from uh, things like images, PDFs, et cetera, as well as SageMaker for building their own models. I want to emphasize this point as well, because this is a, an important trend that I, I think we're seeing more and more in healthcare and life sciences, which is traditionally data can be locked in either to images or even if they're not images, if there's something like PDFs, search can be very, very difficult. What Gilead is doing, uh, and I think that this is you know, a trend that's going to continue more and more, is they're leveraging Textract, which is an AI ML service provided by AWS that can be used for essentially, you can think of it as advanced OCR, but powered by deep learning. So if your data is trapped you know, within tables that are in images or even just handwritten notes, you can use Textract to extract that text essentially enrich your document with that metadata and then search that. This is an important concept because it, in theory, allows users to now search not just over plain text, but even within images if done properly. The key impact here is reducing manual data management uh, by approximately 50%. And they were able to build the data lake, excuse me, within nine months and the search tool within, within three months. Again, I want to emphasize that while you might think that this is not basic science, and on some level uh, it's not purely, this is a huge workforce multiplier uh, that allows basic scientists to do their job. This is another example, uh, a similar type of example coming from 3M. When scientists uh, need to do um, 
uh, more research, the need to access information from prior relevant research. And finding information can be very difficult. Uh, as anyone in the audience who is looking for papers or remembers that they something from a paper, but they can't remember where, uh, th this is a type of problem that uh, directly f uh, feeds into this. The solution here was to use Amazon Kendra to allow data scientists, excuse me, allow scientists in general to find the information they need rapidly, quickly, uh, and efficiently. Again, uh, Kendra, I would say a, a tool, uh, a trend that I'm seeing is a backbone for lots of these types of enterprise search in the context of healthcare and life sciences broadly, as well as uh, scientists uh, more specifically. And again, the impact of this is that engineers and researchers can find the information that they need much faster by just simple uh, natural language queries. And I want to emphasize that this is a step beyond what we've seen in the past, you know, let's say five years ago, of simple keyword search. Simple keyword search still, of course, has its place. Um, and you, there are a number of ways you can architect that. But there's been a lot of advances in natural language processing over the past five years. Uh, as I'm sure the audience is aware, the rise of transformers are a key uh, trend in this, so that uh, services like Kendra can allow for better natural language search. The third theme that I want to discuss is automation and semi-automation. Uh, this is a trend that we're seeing in, uh, I think, broadly in AIML, but specifically in life sciences and healthcare. I want to emphasize that these two, this theme somewhat uh, intersects with basic science at scale. Uh, and also uh, intelligent document processing and search. But automation is a key problem because uh, a, a tremendous problem that's faced both on the enterprise scale, but also for smaller companies is that uh, human beings have to do work. And every, uh, every task that you give a human uh, to do, if they could be doing something that's more worthwhile, that would be even better. So a worthwhile problem that, I, that I've seen all life science companies are thinking about is can a process be automated? And importantly, if it can't be fully automated, can it be semi-automated? When I say semi-automation here, and we'll talk about this as well, uh, it's a recognition of the fact that machine learning models are absolutely not perfect. And, pure, and automating a process that requires human intervention is a mistake. But we frequently see that you can semi-automate a process where, for example, humans are involved with understanding uh, key cases that maybe the machine learning uh, algorithm is not quite there yet, or high profile cases. And I'm going to show a few examples of this. This example comes from Amgen. And again, all of these, I'll have links to these uh, in the YouTube uh, video description. This example comes from Amgen, where very broadly, pharmaceutical companies are responsible for reporting adverse drug events to the FDA, generally within a 24 hour window. This is a complex problem frequently because you might get adverse event reports from all kinds of locations. They might be in a phone call, they might be uh, in a, uh, an unstructured text. So uh, getting this to a stage where even detecting the, um, the adverse drug event uh, can be challenging and recognizing this is an adverse drug event, how can we, uh, and then, using that to report can be complicated. The solution here was leveraging transcribed medical as well as custom model uh, modeling using natural language processing. And the classification algorithm that was, that was built ultimately leads to both fast and accurate identification of adverse events greater than 95% accuracy. And I wanna go back to the theme that I've said. This is assisting manual assessments by increasing accuracy. And this is a prime example that, uh, and I'll show a few others, processes that are AI powered need not be perfect to help in your business use case. In this particular example, this is ma assisting manual assessment because it's essentially scaling the process and removing the adverse event detection from a purely manual process to a semi-automated process. Here's another example. This comes from AstraZeneca. Uh, where they were essentially attempting to do kidney uh, injury assessment. You can see on the right an example of this where you have a uh, glomeruli that uh, may be within the kidney that may be uh, uh, have severe damage or moderate damage or nothing. And the 
problem that they were facing is that this was a purely uh, human driven process at first where uh, pathologists are essentially looking at these images and labeling them and making decisions. By using uh, Amazon SageMaker for labeling this, as well as for performing the classification, uh, this essentially is uh, scaling what used to be a purely human-driven process to give faster scientific insight, uh, as well as uh, removing that human-based bottleneck. And I want to emphasize uh, an important lesson from here also, which is in most cases, machine learning algorithms need to have label data in order to make intelligent insight. Uh, I want to be careful, which is that isn't always true, but in many cases like object recognition, it is. So having a scalable process like AstraZeneca did for labeling uh, objects, uh, and this is also available within the context of SageMaker to label your data, uh, allows for scalable and more reproducible machine learning results. The next example comes from Novartis. Novartis, uh, and this is an example that was a collaboration with AWS, uh, and it's a very large project, which is uh, the business need is to make upstream uh, supply chains, manufacturing processes, distribution, more visible, predictable, efficient, uh, as well as detecting when errors might be happening. This is an important problem that we're seeing in the context of automation and semi-automation, which is machine learning is being used to transition processes from being reactive to being proactive. In the context here, you know, just to give an example with manufacturing, rather than saying, hey, this machine failed, um, how can we fix this in the future? A better approach, and AWS has services for this and you can build your own models, is actually going to be proactive. Can we forecast that this machine will fail? If so, what action should be taken? In the context of Novartis, this is using a plethora of AWS services. I'm showing some here. QuickSight, for example, for analytics, custom modeling using SageMaker. And importantly, I want to emphasize uh, intersection between IoT and these models. IoT's Internet of Things is very important. In the context of manufacturing, if you want ultra low latency uh, insight, you're frequently going to have to deploy your models on edge to specific devices. Uh, and using this insight sensor, center, excuse me, in the context of machine learning models allows uh, for uh, better forecasting, operational, better operational insight, and importantly, at every stage of the, um, of the process, uh, making predictions and leveraging AI ML as much as possible. I want to emphasize one more thing in this example which is that, and this is a common problem that we're seeing more and more, and I would say a broader trend. AI ML in, in most cases, especially, excuse me, complex cases, is not just AI ML. It's AI ML in the context of larger applications. So in this particular example, they're using a local historian for tracking data. You're, you might be leveraging, like shown here, Kafka uh, as a queue. You're gonna be using IoT, uh, I'm show, quick site I mentioned already for analytics, Athena for on the fly querying of data in S3. EMR, Elastic MapReduce can be used for spinning up and down clusters uh, for uh, distributed querying uh, and analysis of data. AI ML in large uh, applications for this is generally not going to be just AI ML. It's going to be AI ML integrated uh, with many other applications and thinking about how to architect that in the context of automation and semi-automation requires thought around each particular use case. Another example for automation uh, that I wanted to discuss uh, is Janssen, uh, which is uh, uh, um, a part of Johnson & Johnson. The business use case here is that Janssen wanted to automate its machine learning model deployments uh, and general workflow uh, to aid in an automated fashion. The problem here, uh, and those data scientists in the audience, I'm sure you identify with this, is that if you have a pipeline, uh, a naive way of doing things is that every once in a while or once a week or something like that, data scientists go in, re-execute um, uh, re pipelines as needed, uh, either when being told to do so or, being, uh, or when they feel that it's the right time to do so or on a schedule. 
But in this context, and I think that this example highlights this, uh, they implemented, Janssen did, an automated ML operation uh, that essentially uh, uh, improved accuracy and importantly is fully automated and can occur, in, and can occur on a schedule. Uh, essentially, feature engineering is done automatically and processes that used to be a data scientist, essentially every once in a while executing the pipeline step by step, instead, and in this particular context, they're leveraging step functions, uh, were, are being done in an automated fashion. Uh, the impact of this is increased speed of data prep by 600%, feature engineering by 700%, and model accuracy of models is now increased by 21%. I want to emphasize this and not to get too far afield, but ML orchestration and proper ML ops is a key concept that I that I like to emphasize and I'm seeing as a trend in the context of automation and semi-automation in, in AI ML. If you're architecting AI ML workloads, you should be thinking about questions like this of, I have a model now, but how do I automate retraining as new data comes in? Uh, a number of uh, AWS orchestration tools, like what I just mentioned, step functions, but there are many others. We now, AWS also has a managed airflow service. You can use airflow. There are a number of different services that can be used uh, for orchestration of ML and using those as soon as your uh, model uh, is deployed is a key uh, concept in the context of automation. So that problems like, as data comes in, how do we retrain? That can be solved by, by automation. Uh, how do I retrain on not, let's say as new data comes in, but on a schedule so that let's, we, we retrain every two months. Or for example, data will come in periodically uh, that we don't need to retrain on, but instead we need to pass this through a model to get predictions. All of this, which are processes that are still sometimes done manually by data scientists, now can be done in a purely automated fashion um, or in the very least a semi-automated fashion uh, by data scientists. And I want to emphasize in this context that uh, orchestration tools like Step Functions uh, and others as well provide visibility to data scientists so that they can keep track of what's going on uh, so that if something fails or maybe a model performance is not uh, quite where it should be, they can stop the deployment. It's not being uh, auto-deployed unless they choose to do so. Another example I wanted to discuss, this is a little bit uh, further away from life sciences, but I did want to uh, mention it. This comes from Q Squared Solutions, where uh, in their business use case, uh, clinical research organizations have to purchase lab tests for clinical trials. These can be very long documents. And if you fail to buy a test that needs to be bought, um, then that's going to delay uh, the clinical trial. In the context of uh, this particular solution, uh, they leverage Textract, Comprehend Medical, as well as SageMaker to build their own custom models as well. Uh, I want to emphasize this again. This is a, a semi-automated process because this is extracting entities. But of course, a human being uh, is involved as well with thinking about this. But this, uh, the impact of this is a 50% reduction in workload uh, when analyzing the clinical uh, trial documents. And I want to emphasize one more point here. I showed previously the AI ML services uh, stack, the three-layered uh, stack that I showed before of AI services, SageMaker, and uh, ML frameworks and infrastructure. You can pick and choose which of these to use. So in this particular example, using Textract and Comprehend Medical, but then your own models within SageMaker. This type of, these kinds of decisions uh, can help speed up uh, your uh, deployment of AI ML workloads because you can choose when to use an AI service for certain contexts as well as your own models for other contexts and focus on what the core science is for you. Um, so with that, uh, those are the examples that I wanted to show. Uh, this is uh, for sure not an exhaustive, li exhaustive list of how AI is being used in healthcare and life sciences. Uh, but again, in the video description that you'll see below, uh, you can, I'll, I'll, I'll provide a link, I'll provide links to each of these uh, use cases and you can go online as well and see other uh, AWS success stories in the context of healthcare life sciences uh, and AIML. Again, uh, thank you so much for having me uh, and I'm happy to take any questions. Joshua, thank you a lot. 
I cannot hear you. Why? Hello? Yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot for your speech. It was great. A lot of amazing examples. And we have uh, several questions. Just a second. So one of them is from three parts. So I'll read it out and I hope that the person will get the most from your reply. What is the role of AI ML in drug discovery? Mainly can AI take over drug design in a more efficient manner than med chemists can do it today? Is there a forecast as to when this may occur? What would you say? Yeah, that's a very broad question and, and a great yeah. question. Um, so uh, I think it's definitely been true uh, that AI ML is playing a larger and larger role in key components of of drug discovery. Um, my experience that I'm that I'm seeing is that uh, that models that AI ML models are and specifically deep learning are making deeper and deeper inroads. And of course, I'm not the first to say this. This has been said many many times. In many many cases. Uh, that were previously not AI ML. Just to give one obviously famous example, AlphaFold has been used uh, uh, with tremendous success for st protein structure prediction. Uh, and since protein structure prediction is essential for uh, targeting uh, molecules that don't have a crystal structure, that kind, that kind of workload is obviously going to be essential in the pipeline of drug discovery. Uh, other processes, for example, I mentioned docking. Uh, there are uh, there are many inroads with deep learning and machine learning in general into docking, uh, whereas traditional methods are, you know, uh, uh, more uh, 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 not necessarily using machine learning or are based on geometries um, or statistical potentials, things like that. Deep learning, I would say, in the next five years, there's going to be many there potentially more inroads of how machine learning is being applied at each and every step. I want to emphasize it's not going to necessarily completely abrogate all manual processes. Of course, experimental validation has to be done. But um, uh, I think that AI ML uh, is going to continue to play more and more of a role uh, in that context. I hope that answered the question. You said there was a, this was a three-part question, so I'm happy to take the next part. Yeah, actually, this like was the three parts already. Mm. So yeah, we have another question. Uh, let me get it. Uh, what, according to you, Joshua, needs to be the government's and state authorities' role in accelerating machine learning in life science and biotechnology? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I want to be, uh, you know, a bit careful about this. Um, so more broadly, what I'm what I'm going to speak about in that context is patient privacy which I think is uh, obviously a huge concern, not just from the government, but pharmaceutical companies uh, are, um, uh, are are thinking about this as well. Uh, the FDA actually released new standards for uh, uh, compute in the context of uh, pharmaceutical, uh, in the pharmaceutical industry and in computing. A key problem here, and again, I wanna not just focus on the government, but generally is how to ensure proper patient privacy uh, in the context of uh, of uh, life sciences, it's essential um, that pharma companies uh, have the correct privacy uh, when they're analyzing genomic data, non-genomic data, healthcare data. Where is PHI in their data? Has it been properly removed uh, where necessary? If it's not necessary to remove it for an application, is it being properly stored? AWS provides a number of different um, use cases. Uh, excuse me, of uh, guidance of how to do this. But I would say that, you know, pharma companies in general and, uh, uh, and everybody has to be con constantly concerned about ensuring that uh, patient privacy uh, is correctly uh, done and deployed and executed on all of their workloads. Thank you. Thank you for the answer. We have more. Just a second. A lot of scientific documents, they actually have um, like a copyright uh, on the information they provide, provide and the intellectual property. 
is there any way like of using those kind of information in the research? So it obviously depends on the nature of the copyright and it depends what you're doing. Um, so, you know, you, obviously you, uh, if it's against the copyright to ingest a document and do search on it, uh, you can't necessarily do so. But what I wanted to emphasize, you know, in the examples that I showed about enterprise search, these are generally being used on proprietary data. So I wanna take this question and emphasize a, a, an even simpler point, which is pharma companies are implementing better search on their own proprietary data. They might have previous research that they know exists and is siloed somewhere, but no one can search it because search capabilities have not been done. So whether that's ingesting their own internal documents, ingesting uh, you know, proprietary research, these types of uh, search services like Kendra are allowing for better search on these proprietary documents as well. Second to this, many papers are published um, and are essentially open access. Uh, better search over these kinds of documents uh, it also enables uh, you know, research as well. Thank you. Um, let's take uh, one more, the just a short one. Uh, we have another speaker coming in a minute. So the question sure. is, uh, are the AWS service free or fee? And can Amazon keep some part of total information from del for themselves when I generate, analyze, or store the data using AWS platform? It's the question from Rush. Sure. So when you bring your data to AWS, uh, you own it. It's, it's, it's your data. Um, in the, and that's true for like, let's say you're building your own ML models or you're doing anything else with your data. When you're using the AI ML services, um, so you pass your data to the service and you get back the result. Uh, each service is of course a bit different and it, it was asked whether they're fee or free. Some of them are free tier available um, or eligible, but you know, uh, the, the different services, there is a, a cost associated with using each one. How each one is built obviously depends on uh, the particular service, but I did want to emphasize many of the AIML services are free tier eligible. In terms of AWS uh, leveraging your data, this uh, this depends a bit on the service. Uh, some of the services AWS does leverage a bit of the data to uh, um, to improve the service. You can opt out of this though by uh, choosing to opt out in writing if you wanted to. That's for some of the services and other of the services, other of the services, excuse me, like Comprehend Medical completely do not uh, leverage uh, any data at all that you use, that you pass to it to improve the service. They're um, essentially, uh, 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 they, they're essentially REST APIs that the data comes in, the response comes out, and then nothing is saved on the AWS uh, side. Um, but I wanted to more generally emphasize that as you bring your data to AWS, you have control over what region, you have control over how it's used, uh, and you uh, own that data. So basically, all the data which AWS uh, receives are protected and used only by the owner of this data, right? Exact exactly. Thank you. I would ask more questions, but unfortunately, we're, we have our schedule. Uh, Joshua, would you share your contacts to the audience um, that they would send some questions to you directly? Yeah. You can also add them to the description of this live stream. Ab absolutely. So yeah, everybody will be able to find Joshua's contacts and send him the direct email, whatever worries this person. And we're going to the second speaker thank nice you Joseph. it's been a pleasure it's been a pleasure hosting you i hope that we will meet very soon again yeah nice to meet you uh, uh nice to meet everybody and uh thank you mike uh for inviting me and it was uh, a pleasure to be here thank you thank you so we're switching to andrew sats uh andrew um andrew is co-founder of EDQLV Inc. and is applied AI researcher and he's going to talk about applying AI to drug discovery and development. Andrew? 
are here. Yeah, I'm just taking myself off mute. Yeah, great. Thanks so much. Can you see this yeah. okay, Mike? Everything good? Yeah, we can hear you, so the stage is yours. Fantastic. Can you see the uh, slide? Yes. Perfect. Okay, thanks so much we... for thanks good. so much for having me. Um, this talk will be a, a bit different from uh, Joshua's, um, a little bit more high level. Um, so I want to think about something that you've ever read or have you ever read or seen anything that's changed your life? Now, all my life, I've actually been interested in the value of patterns, but it wasn't until 2006 that I discovered how to create value out of this interest. So what happened in 2006? Well, that's the year Hadoop was launched. And if you don't know about Hadoop, it's an open source software technology to facilitate the use of a network of many computers to solve problems involving massive amounts of data and computation. It launched what's now known as the big data era. Now, this was a fact I did not learn until 2011. And before 2006, I knew nothing about AI. That year, I just happened to read an article that changed my life because it put AI in perspective. It was a fascinating to read because it showed me how powerful seemingly disconnected data sets could be used to do something that I thought was impossible. The data came from a European cell phone provider that wanted to predict if their customers planned to cancel their service. Now, not only were the researchers able to predict churn, customer churn, but they were also able to use the same data to predict where individuals would physically be at at any given point in time. And they were able to use this one data set to create multiple sources of value. And this pattern prediction got me hooked in learning about AI. Now, at the time, I barely knew what AI meant. And it started my 15-year journey into the exploration of the valuable applications of AI and an education in how to implement those powerful tools. Since 2006, I've also been asking people inside and outside the space, data scientists, business leaders, and everyday people what they think AI is. The main takeaway from years of asking this question is that everyone has a different perspective on what it is. Some think it's Alexa, others think it's self-driving cars, while others think it's the Terminator. Now, these answers and 15 years of researching and applying AI has led me to understand three things. First, is that because AI does not have a consistent definition, and because there are a wide variety of uses, that we need a common language around AI as a tool. Second, is thinking of AI as a product does not solve challenges. You don't hire a carpenter to use a hammer. You hire the carpenter to build something. AI is a tool like the hammer. So it's important to use a framework to keep in mind that AI is a tool and focus on the problems that it's solving. To put it another way, what AI does is more important than what AI is. Third, is that leveraging the power of AI can be done by understanding the tool through frameworks. And this allows us to, from whatever position we're in, from developer to CEO to leaders of nations, to use AI to solve issues, transform industries and organizations, and become more aware and engage users of AI. Now, tools are instruments that help us solve tasks at hand. Tools are important expressions of our collective knowledge. Many examples of these exist throughout history, from fire to airplanes. And each one of these examples could be seen through the lens of the multiple applications, depending on the issue they're aiming to solve. We know airplanes enable our ability to move things or people faster from one place to another. We're trying to move, and why differentiates the tool and the particular challenges. When we look at it through this lens, AI should not be seen as, to, as a technology that can simulate human intelligence, a smart machine, or some theoretical statistical algorithm, but rather as a tool that can be used in a distinct way depending on what problem it's trying to solve. Or as economist Theodore Lever once put it, no one wants a drill, what they want is the whole. The same thing could be said about AI. It's less about the tool than what it can do. Some people think that AI is the product. It's not. It's enabling technology that allows new products to be built. The breakthrough products will be AI first, built on these models from day one by entrepreneurs 
and business leaders who understand both what the models can do and what people actually want to use. So how do we change our thinking of AI as a product to AI as a tool? Well, in business, as well as science and other areas, humans tend to use frameworks to help guide these cre their creations. I believe AI could then be could be then shaped as a tool if we looked at it through a framework I call the five AIs: automated, assistive, analytical, accelerated, and augmented intelligence. This framework is meant to help everyone involved in the development of an AI-based solution to understand the why, when, how, and what type of AI application can be leveraged to solve a problem. So let me share with you how you can use it by starting with some examples of these five AIs through the lens of biotech and pharma. Now automation or automated intelligence minimizes human intervention in a physical process, typically with machines. In biotech and pharma, automation can be applied to a whole host of operations, including clinician engagement, clinical trials, and laboratory processes. For example, Using data from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, automated systems can track which doctors are performing which procedures and use that data to draw conclusions about particular therapeutics or procedures that can improve the lives of patients. In clinical trials, wearables can automatically track vitals, location, sleep schedules in ways that are much more accurate and consistent than self-reported data. In drug discovery, Robotic lab automation can be used to produce and test novel candidates by mimicking manual and labor-intensive tasks and performing repetitive tasks, often at scale that is impossible for human hands. Now, assistive intelligence means enabling mental tasks to be performed faster, including supporting cognitive tasks that would be nearly impossible without a computer such as calculating the square root of 4,088,484. It's 2022, in case you were wondering. Now, keeping in mind what your intention or problem to solve is helps recognizing how AI can be assistive and what tasks need to be supported. For example, at our company, Evolve, our mission is to transform how medicine is discovered and developed. With this in mind, we set out to build tools to generate drugs for diseases like cancer. Now, each potential drug we generate comes with over 3,000 data points. And what if we want to know how similar 100 drug candidates generated by a technology are? Well, if we're looking at 100 potential drug candidates, then we're generating over 300,000 data points, which is far too many for any human mind to correlate at once. And this is where assistive intelligence can come into play. Now, mathematician Clive Humbley said, Data is the new oil, and like oil, in order to become valuable, data must be extracted, cleaned, and processed so that it can be transformed into information. That information can then be converted into knowledge to allow individuals and organizations to take action. And that's where analytical intelligence comes in, because it offers the capability to transform data into usable and relevant knowledge. Analytical intelligence allows data to be transformed into a human interpretable format. One way to do this is to visualize the data with a pie chart, for example, which allows human experience and inference to be combined with information. Now that combination becomes knowledge and provides the ability to make a decision. Terms such as business intelligence are examples of the conversion of data into information that allows individuals or teams to make a decision. But imagine that instead of producing 300,000 data points, we produce, we produce 80 billion data points. Now that's much harder to visualize in a way that a human can interpret for decision-making purposes, especially beyond three dimensions. And this is where analytical intelligence layers can come into play because the computer can use statistical inference and perform probabilistic analysis on the data. Analytical int intelligence can convert the data into knowledge, allowing computers to make a decision in the limited scope of whatever the analytical intelligence is programmed to perform. Now, unlike business intelligence, which requires human interaction to convert information to knowledge, this conversion of data into knowledge occurs because the machine is programmed to mimic human decision making. Now, automated, assistive, and analytical intelligence exper expedite various research and medical processes. Accelerated intelligence provides a way to predict outcomes through various types of modeling. At Evolve, we use accelerated intelligence for drug discovery to fail as quickly as possible 
and as often as in the computer where the time and costs are low instead of failing in the laboratory where the costs and time are high. It can also be particularly useful, accelerated intelligence, for adaptive clinical trial design, which applies Bayesian statistics to clinical trials. Now, in some cases, it can be very harmful to accelerate, especially in medicine, where moving too quickly can be a significant safety risk. Expediting clinical trials harbors the inherent risk including side effects and tos toxicity, to name a couple. In such cases, accelerated intelligence can potentially measure and predict whether a drug will be toxic in certain states, potentially limiting clinical study failures. It's the predictive power of accelerated intelligence that could determine the duration of preclinical and clinical trials, identify novel and pre-validated drug candidates, and facilitate the removal of therapeutic candidates that might otherwise have received significant time funding and resources. Automated, assistive, analytical, and accelerated intelligence are meant to augment human behavior. A calculator, which is a form of assistive intelligence, is augmenting the ability to add, subtract, multiply, divide. The, calculate mimic, the calculator mimics human intelligence and makes the person better at something they already know how to do. When a radiologist is augmented, by automated highlighting of a tumor in a scan, it allows time to engage in additional critical activities. Google provides easy access to information, augmenting an individual's ability to sift through vast amounts of information. If we consider automated, assisted, analytical, and accelerated intelligence together, then we can begin to see how aug aug augmented intelligence can support the advancement of individuals, organizations, or methods. Now, understanding AI through these five AI frameworks allows you to leverage the power of AI from the position of where you are. If you're a data scientist, it'll help you become a better data scientist by building tools that can solve real problems. If you're a business leader, by using the framework, you can see how to leverage the power of the tool to transform your organization. And if you're interested in AI, then thinking about it through the lens can help you understand the impact on your life and help you become more engaged. So now that we have a common framework to understand AI as a tool that can automate, analyze, accelerate, assist, and augment, we can now start to begin to solve challenges. And when looking at a problem or an opportunity, the question is about whether we can and should automate. Think of the times you received automated robocalls about an expired car warranty. And there's an example where automation should not be used. Or how about whether it's or not it's dangerous to accelerate? In medicine, for example, as I mentioned earlier, moving too quickly can be a significant safety risk. Expediting clinical trials harbors the inherent risks associated with side effects and toxicity. Whether we're actually assisting or making, we, we also need to think about whether we're actually assisting or making things worse. There are legitimate concerns that there's a definitely a dumbing down when it comes to the ability to spell as a result of autocomplete. But in healthcare, autocomplete could be a game changer for doctors who are burning out because of, among other things, inputting data into clinical records. This is why it's so important to understand and apply AI in an important way. So how do you decide where to apply AI? Well, there's natural steps that can lead you to apply AI. The initial step comes from understanding needs and pain points and then defining and prioritizing an outcome. A very common use case in healthcare, AI and radiology may help you think through the process and, and how and what to apply AI to. In radiology, there are a whole host of pain points. Radiological scans like X-rays or CTs are some of the most common diagnostic tools in medicine, meaning that lots of them are created. So there's definitely a need for those who can read the scans. There's also a need to prioritize which scans to read. There's a need because of the shortage of radiologists worldwide. So it would seem that finding a way to automate the reading and analyzing of scans to help prioritize could alleviate some of this pain to understand where and what to apply AI to. We need to understand the pain points and the needs. And so thinking of AI as a tool and having a framework to, to get you there, I'd love to share what many companies that have leveraged AI through a whole host of needs and applications in pharma and biotech. To start, I wanna frame the potential applications through sickness and health. Generally, when people see a doctor, it's because they're sick. When they have a checkup where they change their diet, they're taking actions for their health. So it's important to acknowledge that most of what's happening in pharma and biotech is not for healthcare, it's for sick care. 
So one question to ask when thinking about the AI you build and could be building, is this helping people who are sick or is it helping keeping people from becoming sick? If you're using AI for drug discovery, then you're helping people who are sick. And if you're building AI that leverages wearables data to improve sleep, then you're helping people stay healthy. Now also, what's the difference between a pharma, a biotech and a pharma? Generally speaking, biotechs are research and development companies that help shepherd molecules through the process of becoming a drug. They do things like early discovery work, animal testing and human testing and clinical trials. Pharmaceutical companies are generally manufacturing and selling approved pharmaceuticals. They participate in running human testing, but most often in later stages, the drug is getting closer to patients. So there are a whole host of stages that a, that a drug has to go through to get from being a concept to being a medicine that a doctor describes. And the first stage is target identification. Now, only close to 400 genes are proven for US FDA approved drugs. 80% of, of human genes are unexplored as targets and some are considered undruggable. Target discovery is the process that scientists use to identify a unique location in the body that is targetable for the development of a drug molecule. In the case of COVID, for example, this was the spike protein. Now, there are thousands of possible targets in the human body. The identification and selection of novel drug targets have remained major challenges in drug discovery as the identification of a molecular target requires assessment of genomics, proteomics, and other omics, both in vitro and in vivo experimental data interpretation. The challenge lies in the lack of technology to break down the complex biological networks and map them thoroughly. Data mining, which combines analytical and assistive intelligence, particularly in bioinformatics, can be used to identify, select, and prioritize potential disease targets. Genetic association studies can help scientists identify genes associated with a particular disease. This method studies the DNA of large groups of people searching for small variations. Each study can look at thousands or millions of variations at the same time and identify those that occur more frequently in people with a certain disease. If those variations are associated with the disease, research can now point to genes that may be associated with a disease that can be tested. This combines analytical, assisted, and augmented intelligence. And these types of variations have been um, used to identify conditions from ranging from heart disease and Parkinson's disease to diabetes. They can also be associated with a person's response to medicine to predict more accurately which treatment status strategies will work in particular groups, which leads us to precision medicine. Now, if we know a relevant target, then we can begin to use all five of the AIs and apply them to drug discovery. And this is where novel, relevant chemical or biological agents are identified and evaluated through a series of lab and early animal studies to determine their effect on cells and tissues to, to model the impact on a disease. This is a long and arduous process involving generating and identifying compounds. Machine learning is being used to generate predictive models for a range of physical and biological endpoints. Generative models are able to extract patterns from massive data, databases and use this information for the design of novel molecules. Now, over the past few years, there's been a drastic increase in biological data creation. In fact, the number three fastest growing data source in the world is biological data. However, this varied creation of data presents challenges in acquiring, cleaning, and applying that knowledge to answer complex biological questions. At Evolve, this is where our efforts are focused. We leverage advances in computation and massive data sets to com teach computers to generate novel therapeutic antibodies. Seven of the top 20 selling drugs in the world are antibodies, and there are two main goals for new drugs. The first is getting two clinical trials, and the second is getting through clinical trials. Now, just getting two clinical trials fails 90% of the time and can take up to five years. And much of this starts with modeling immune systems, which, which prior to machine learning was done in an animal or in a vial. Now, at Evolve, the immune system is in the computer which allows us to search our database of target relevant antibodies. But we go further because it's not just generating antibodies that's a challenge. Scientists need to ensure those antibodies can, be drug, can become drugs. So what does that mean? Well, 
if, for example, an antibody is not stable at 98 degrees Fahrenheit or 37 degrees Celsius, then it won't be stable in the human body because that's the temperature of the human body. So how do you know how to do that? Or if you can't manufacture the antibody at scale and you can't get it to market. And so the question is, how do you model things like thermostability or manufacturability? And how do you know if your models are working? These are the types of questions that we attempt to answer every day at Evolve. One of the other challenges comes from training and testing. Just because the models tell you something is going to bind to a target or be manufactured or be manufacturable, how do you prove it? Scientists are some of the most skeptical people on the planet, and this is where lab tub is to come in. But unless like running a train test split in the cloud, it's not so simple or inexpensive to do the same in the lab. In the case of the antibodies, for example, each antibody created costs about $1,000 to test, and labor is intensive, taking six to 12 months. Imagine running models, and to run your test, you need a million dollars and six months. I assume that this is what it was like building machine learning models in the 1990s. But this is also where automated intelligence can come into play because over time, as synthetic biology labs reach scale, we'll begin to see the costs come down. Despite these challenges, the value of computational approaches is a way to reduce the search space. At Evolve, we use our modeling techniques to reduce possible therapeutic antibody candidates from 10 to the 10th down to 10 to the 5th. Now, once a molecule has been discovered, the preclinical phase of drug discovery takes shape, and it involves extensive safety evaluations of the potential therapeutic invention, intervention, often using cell and animal models of diseases. Now, because we're testing in animals, a review of the pathology of the disease commonly includes going through a large number of histopathological studies. This contributes to the drug development process being time consuming and labor intensive for pharmaceuticals companies and contract research organizations. Preclinical studies can involve very difficult analysis tasks that need to be repeated over and over and over again, which is time consuming and costly. Now, when detecting vague and unclear targets, as is commonly the case in histopathology, the risk of intra-observer variation and subjectivity increases. These targets often need to be detected in huge amounts leading of, of data, leading the work to be split among several pathologists and scientists, also increasing the risk of inter-observer variation. Analytical and automated intelligence increases not only the speed, but the precision and accuracy of the review of the samples. With AI-powered image analysis, the risk of all of these can be minimized as the AI model can be trained to detect even the slightest variation and changes with high consistency and high reproducibility of results. Validation of research results is another section in preclinical studies that can benefit from AI. Scientific validations requires objective evidence that the models for obtaining results are robust, reliable, and reproducible. A well-trained AI model is exactly this. Using models in preclinical studies can not only significantly improve and accelerate preclinical study workflows, but also standardize analysis, help find hard to find spots, and give important visual feedback that helps interpreting current and future results. Now let's talk about clinical studies, a step in the drug development pipeline that averages five to seven years. This timeline is due to the traditional flow of data across the clinical trial life cycle, which can become a complicated maze of manual effort, rework, and inefficiency. As one life sciences executive summary summed up, we still use the same processes that we used over 50 years ago. It feels like it's 1972 not 2022. So what are the, some of the technologies that can speed and improve clinical trials? Well, from a patient engagement perspective, let me share, you, share with you two examples. First, automated intelligence powering wearable devices can lessen the need for participants in clinical trials to travel to a physical site, which can enable an organization to recruit patients and diversify clinical trial participation. Second, and not too distant, is remote patient monitoring which allows patients to participate in clinical trials with fewer potential hassles. Automated and analytical intelligence algorithms can be used to understand 
individual patient behaviors or needs, resulting in more patient-centric interactions and better retention. Now, one of the most interesting use cases is computational clinical trials. The process involves running a simulating clinical trial to model what would occur during a clinical experiment, similar to what we do at Evolve for drug discovery. This process holds the promise of decreasing the time and cost of testing the safety and efficacy assessment of clinical trials. It could re also reduce the need for animal and human testing. Part of a digital clinical trial involves generating digital replicas of a patient or groups of patients based upon diverse scientific and clinical sources called digital twins. Digital twins have the potential to represent the complex and dynamic relations within biological networks. Digital twins could give us a deeper understanding of biology and be used as an accelerated framework to better target patient populations and design better drugs. And we don't need to create a whole new person, a whole new digital person, as we can start smaller, creating digital twins of organs. The liver is a key organ in the body that is implicated in various diseases and liver toxicity is actually a leading, leading cause of drug failures. A digital twin of the liver could be used to predict drug toxicity. This can be done by integrating various liver functions, diseases, and the effects of drugs using assistive and analytical intelligence. In studies, these digital twins of the liver have been effective in reproducing the impact of treatments. AI-enabled data collection and digital twins are just two of a myriad of ways to manage and accelerate the clinical trial process and help get treat new treatments to patients more quickly. Now, it's important to remember that as, as much as those, develop, as those developing AI would like to see these advances be adopted quickly and widely, regulatory frameworks around, around new pharmaceutical inventions are necessary constraints on the speed of adoption. Regulations exist to protect patients, but we should not allow these constraints to stifle our vision. It may be a hundred years away or less, but you can imagine a future where you walk into a doctor's office and rather than being prescribed a medicine that is sitting on a shelf at a pharmacy, a medicine is created on site just for you. And this is why it's so important to start imagining what the future should look like. Take the time to imagine what the world should like like. Custom designed medicines may be a hundred years away, but we need to start on the path there. Dream big and focus on success. If the vision is a hundred years away, then imagine what needs to happen in 10 years. Work your way backwards. Ask yourself, what can I do today to help make that vision a reality? Find or start a company that is working to make that vision a reality. Take what you would imagine would happen in 10 years and try to accomplish it in six months. You likely won't get there, but you'll definitely be a lot closer. Let me share one warning though. 500,000 years ago, humans began to use fire. The control of fire changed the course of human evolution. Similarly, like humans were with fire 500,000 years ago, we are at the dawn of AI. And like fire, it has the potential to change humanity as we know it. But like early man's use of fire, AI requires great care and motivation to make it useful. It's in your hands to make it destructive or beneficial to humanity. I urge you to be passionate, inspired, thoughtful, careful and considerate of the AI, whichever of the five you choose to build. Dream big and prepare yourself for an exciting new world. Thank you. Andrew, thank you for your speech. It's been great. Easy listening. Listen, uh, we have uh, several questions. So the first one is, where do you see agent-based models as digital twins in clinical studies? This question is from Andrew. Where do you see agent-based models as digital twins in clinical studies? Yeah, so um, this is actually not my area of expertise. I have researched into this space quite a bit. Um, I think in the near term, what's gonna happen is that 
Um, so before you actually go into clinical trial, you actually need to design a protocol to for that clinical trial. And what we'll what we'll likely see in the near term is digital twins being uh, leveraged for clinical trial design not as substitutes in clinical trials. This will be a way to optimize and fail in the computer using digital twins. It could also be used for patient um, stratification. So you can make variations of different types of patient cohorts using digital twins. And what I mean by cohorts would be, for example, um, you know, separating um, digital twins by sex, by race, by um, genetic makeup, and those will be uh, potentially used to start creating patient stratification in things like adaptive clinical trials. Adaptive clinical trials are, most clinical trials are frequentist in nature. If you're familiar with frequentist and Bayesian statistics, until 2012, um, we didn't really see any, all clinical trials were frequentist in nature. So you can potentially see um, digital twins being used in, in adaptive clinical trials, which are basically Bayesian clinical trials, to understand when you're collecting data through the clinical trial itself, as, as the drug is being tested in clinical trials, collect that data about the patients and the response, and use that to stratify patients into the next cohort, so as you're moving through the clinical trial design. Um, hopefully that answers your question. I hope I hope that you have answered the question. So we are moving for another one. Um, how do you get data for feeding your ML modules? Sure. So um, right now, as I mentioned earlier, the third largest growing data set in the world is biological data, and this has really been driven by uh, the Human Genome Project and um, the sequencing data. So for our models, um, we use a host of public data, usually um, UNIREF, UNIPROT, you can find those data sets online. Um, also, we license data from uh, universities uh, to, that, to make sure that we have our own proprietary data sets. Um, and then the other side of the data is the data that's generated from the lab. So we use the data to train the models, but in order to, to increase, to, to make the models continuously learn because it's machine learning, not machine doing, we take the data from the labs from those molecules that we generate and use it as a feedback loop into our system so we can get better and better drugs for that particular target. One of the things that I um, we're not quite there yet, at least with the antibodies, is being able to associate function. So the way that I describe um, drug function is its ability to, um, to not only hit the target, but have an impact on the target, right? Because it's not just so simple as, you know, landing a punch. You want to be able to make that punch impactful. And so we're not that quite there yet with function and understanding how specific drugs uh, impact a particular function. There are PPI data sets, protein-protein interaction data sets, um, that are being used to narrow that information down. But but we as a as a as an industry aren't quite there yet in being able to link a drug to its particular function. And so when we get that testing data back from the lab that allows us to understand that function, we can feed that information back into uh, our models to say, you know, we have, let's say hundred drugs that are not functional and 10 that are, that are functional, we can say be more like these and less like those using the modeling techniques that we do. Um, and we're also um, generating data ourselves. So we have, you know, you can augment your data set and continuously generate more data that allows you to um, make your model smarter. You've, you may have seen this in radiology where they may um, modify a scan or flip it so hopefully that helps to answer the question. Definitely, yes. Thank you a lot. We're actually a bit off of the schedule, but nothing terrible has happened. Thank you a lot for, for the presentation, for your answers. I see that we have answered the Andrew's question and the second one, the second one also has been answered. So thank you a lot and I hope to see you soon. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, everybody. Take care. We're moving to our third speaker, um, Dmitry Krasnenko. He is head of the laboratory of epigenetics, PhD in genetics, and research lead at Blackthorn AI. He's going to talk about the latest trends in gene pathway analysis. Dmitry. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Uh, I'm glad to be here and uh, well, to, to take my, my speech. And actually, uh, uh, about uh, pathway analysis, uh, 
when we are talking about it, it's from from many people it sounds a bit abstract. Why 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 do we need it? And when we are talking about biology, it's, we are we are working with quite complicated uh, like organized structures, and only just simple uh, example of uh, growth hormone action, uh, we can understand like the deep complexity of uh, like data data and how we can. Uh, and extract some additional value uh, from uh, in cooperation of pathway analysis in our researches. So uh, just uh, like an example growth hormone, it's some substance, some peptide which uh, like synthesized by your pituitary glands in your brain and then it's distributed through blood flow and different uh, tissues and mainly like liver and muscles. They have like huge number of receptors for it and growth hormone beans to them and stimulates protein synthesis through JK2 uh, pathway and, and phosphorus 3K pathway. Uh, it's uh, like uh, increase synthesis of uh, proteins uh, and uh, one of them like main targets is IGF1 so it's uh, it directly affects uh, transcription and when we are talking about like biological regulations we always have to like, remember that we have we have uh, uh, working with uh, DNA RNA protein uh, central dogma when uh, like and then we have like uh, loop and protein affects uh, DNA transcription and now we are uh, today we'll we'll be talking mainly about RNA and uh, transcription as it's uh, kind of a relatively cheap and good marker of cell state and what is going on in the organism or cell if we see that like uh, some genes up regulated or down regulated we can sometimes predict uh, what is going on there and how it can be working and when we are looking on this pathway it's complexity huge and it, actually not all connections uh, showed here because pathways like they, it's, it's never the end. Some target hits another one, and they involve it more or less in in other pathways. And it's uh, overall uh, this pathways that has uh, some mutual space uh, between uh, genes and proteins. Uh, and when uh, we are talking about growth hormone, it's uh, it has like a huge uh, uh, like acceleration in protein synthesis. And protein and, and, and growth of uh, cells and uh, like overall organism. And um, to, to but just uh, going back to the RNA seq, what is RNA seq? Basically, uh, when we are talking about RNA seq, we, we are thinking about some biological tissue sample uh, which was like uh, homogenized in some way and RNA was extracted from it. From RNA, we obtain like some cDNA, and then we uh, synthesize this DNA, uh, sequence, sequence this uh, cDNA in a sequence machine, like uh, Illumina, and we obtain like some sh short reads uh, for every like uh, a gene, um, and uh, there could be a bunch of different reads, of, uh, and we can map them on uh, reference genes, uh, like when when we are using a, a reference genome. And for different genes in different samples, there will be like different number uh, of reads mapped and a proportion of these reads, it's kind of interesting for us because uh, the more uh, reads we have for some gene and when we normalize it for like for overall number of reads and, and for length of, of the gene, uh, we can like uh, talk about uh, its counts. Uh, but in, in even more interesting, it uh, becomes when we compare uh, two samples with like different conditions, for example, uh, sample one is like control sample, and sample two is a uh, sample with uh, some pathology. And when, when we are combining, uh, when we have many people uh, with control and with pathology data for data for genes, we can actually calculate if uh, they have a different uh, expression uh, in these genes. Uh, why is this needed? Because uh, we are people and we have like. The, uh, Different uh, story and different story, and our parents diff had different story. Um, uh, for example, if your mother was like uh, uh, fasting or uh, during uh, like pregnancy, it could be not so good for you. And actually, this uh, under undertaking of nut nutrients, it could affect you in the future, and you will be more prone to diabetes, and maybe even your children will be more prone to diabetes. 
And for example, like um, some offspring from uh, parents, uh, well, from fathers who like, conceive uh, later in life, they have longer telling years and also like affects the and stuff. And so we have like all of this um, like noise uh, from a different uh, genome, like we have different uh, mutations and we have different epigenome and we have like uh, some uh, exposome when we like through our life, uh, when we have uh, early childhood, some trauma, et cetera, it also affects uh, uh, overall our life and it has uh, long lasting effects. And that's why we need a huge number of uh, patients uh, in every group, uh, in healthy group and in control group uh, and in a disease group. And then we can extract uh, mostly about affected genes. Mm. It's uh, a bit easier when we are working with uh, cell lines. Uh, uh, most of drugs, uh, they are going through this stage of cell lines testing when you add in uh, your drug to cell line in, in a petri dish. And you see if uh, like some uh, changes occurred, some uh, like changes which uh, want to occur. Uh, so ba ba basically, uh, when we are comparing digit and untreated samples, we can uh, also uh, calculate this uh, di difference, uh, differential expression uh, signatures, uh, and it will be it will require a lower amount of samples as they are like more even in terms of genetics and exposure and uh, like their previous history. And for different drugs, you can uh, like accumulate a, a number of signatures for different cell lines, for like different cancer lines. And when you have disease and you have this signature, you can uh, try to find uh, some uh, drugs which will be able um, to like treat it, to, to treat this disease. Uh, and it's like uh, it's, it's a field which are now like uh, quite growing, growing up quite fast. And like we are doing some research in this area too. Uh, and also it's uh, quite important to find targets for gene therapy because uh, we have, uh, and when we are talking about gene therapy, um, if we affect some gene which are like uh, at the top of the pathway, it has a lot of connections. Uh, we will be able to like provide significant uh, upregulation or downregulation or affecting on the pathway. And it could be, a, a, like, uh, in, we can be interested in this. But sometimes maybe we want to try to, to, to find some genes which are closer to other like uh, point of interest in order to like uh, disrupt uh, or non -dis not, to not disrupt expression levels of uh, other genes in the pathway. And it's quite important because uh, now gene therapy is uh, like on its, uh, in, in anti-engine, uh, for example, it's only developing and we have like few like targets uh, which are well known for like, a long time. And there are, like, it, it's, it's pro probably there are better targets uh, and we can find them during pathway analysis and we will be able to find uh, like um, uh, tar more better targets in gen for gen therapy uh, with a huger effect and with, which will lead to like longer lives and maybe healthier lives, longer lives, lifespan and health span. So when we're uh, working with the gene expression data, almost always we are uh, working with the uh, differential expression between control and sample, or between uh, like uh, treated and untreated samples. And to do this, uh, we have to have like two group of people, uh, and we like pro pro we, we do many source. We can do many many sorts of calculations. And, uh, uh, our main goal to goal to find like samples which are significantly uh, different in their expression between groups and to calculate magnitude of this expression sometimes but all, not all of the uh, uh, using it and now most popular uh, tools is uh, dissect two but actually uh, it's not always the best option for like uh, some uses and if you see an article that the guys used another one or if they had done they, they just we don't we don't want to use DSEQ uh, better to like uh, to understand why why they didn't do this because uh, it can it could cause uh, significant uh, like performance loss if you use another technique or if you will do quantile normalization uh, it's like quite often used especially in CMAT project it was used uh, but it uh, could uh, like reduce um, could, it, it it could cut, cut some uh, signal uh, from your data and you have to be careful about it. Uh, and uh, 
Actually, there are a bunch of data uh, and, and a bunch of tools to analyze this data in RNA seq, and it's overwhelming to understand uh, which one of them better, which one of them worse. And uh, quite a good review was published by uh, Brian Tal, where they have shown that uh, not uh, uh, performs equally good, and like actually all of these images uh, they have their limitations, pros and cons, and we, we, we have to assess and pay uh, and keep in mind. Uh, all their um, all features. So uh, overall, when we are talking about uh, pathway analysis, uh, there are like two types, but second type we can divide on like two subtypes. So uh, first type is just uh, analysis which preserves uh, gene gene set, but don't preserve uh, connections between them. And it's not always good, especially if you wanna propagate signal uh, through our. Uh, a network, or if you want to understand if it's it's, if it's effective. Uh, another, um, like we said, they are they, they call topology based methods, and they uh, preserve all the connections, and sometimes even uh, preserve the direction of connections and like how uh, every genes affect uh, uh, its uh, like down down uh, downstream targets. Uh, why, why does this is this is important? Because sometimes uh, we can see quite uh, small changes, uh, but when we propagate them from through the uh, pathway, and if it uh, co uh, connect, if it's uh, uh, placed in some uh, like um, entry point of the assay and affects all targets, it could be quite significant. Even those uh, overall amplitude will be not so huge. So. Uh, what basically was done in the article? Guys uh, just cho uh, have chosen 75 data sets for different diseases, and they have run uh, multiple uh, instruments uh, uh, in order to like, find uh, pathways relevant to these data sets. For example, if it's data sets from Alzheimer's disease, you just uh, you, your, your tool will perform good if it will be like uh, will have uh, like relatively high run, run for like first or second, or and when it has like a uh, good p value. And as uh, guys showed, it's not always uh, like possible um, through all pathways, uh, so, uh, analysis tools, and uh, uh, through uh, all uh, genes. Uh, the, the, the data sets uh, overall uh, ranks of target pathways was uh, surprisingly high. If you are talking about medium, so almost uh, any uh, tool was able to predict uh, like twenties or like uh, even set ten uh, medium for like our, our our data, and p value uh, also was uh, quite high. Uh, so as you can see, the the like performance of these methods, methods they are quite limited. And, but overall accuracy, uh, area on the curve uh, was not so bad, and especially for GCAA and for uh, SPIA and drone tools. And if you are talking about uh, topology-based uh, and non-topology-based uh, methods, uh, topology-based performed a bit better. Uh, then, uh, guys did uh, quite important uh, benchmarking and it wasn't done uh, almost uh, like for any tool uh, in the internet uh, and for NSIC analysis. Uh, they uh, checked as a biases to null hypothesis testing. So basically uh, you can take all controls from all your data you know, from different uh, data sets and then uh, randomly split them to control disease data sets uh, like, and you can generate a lot of this uh, like subsets and analyze them uh, on different pathways and with different reasons. And what it uh, does, uh, it calculates how many genes uh, has uh, their uh, are prone to be uh, like over uh, optimistic or over pessimistic. Uh, I mean, if they are uh, prone to like increase significant, the number of significant pathway or decrease uh, this number. And as you may see, the best uh, tool in this case was GCAA. It was uh, it had uh, zero uh, BS pathway, and like also Ronto tools and SPA was not, not so bad, uh, especially in terms of, uh, of well, in, 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 in terms uh, in, in, if to compare them with with uh, another tools, 
And for, for example, if, if you will uh, take a closer look, uh, pre uh, some instruments we, instruments which uh, showed a good uh, ranking uh, for target pathways. Previously, they are not so good in terms of uh, pathway biases, especially in biases uh, toward uh, zero, like for project, which was quite good uh, before. And you also you can see that uh, this bias is uh, uneven between pathways. Uh, some pathways uh, like want to be more biased toward zero or toward one. Uh, one of the sources of this is the number of genes. So different pathways has different number of genes. Uh, and that's why if, if you have smaller number of genes, probably it's easier uh, to be like uh, predicted as significantly affected pathways, even though this is uh, like pay attention to it and uh, do normalization to a number of genes in the pathway. And most of the uh, most of the data were analyzed with the pathway risk uh, database. Uh, actually, for GCA uh, also can be used uh, MC data, the database, which has a lot of uh, gene sets from different uh, you know, like uh, sources uh, with different biological meaning. meaning. Um, and when we are talking about pathway analysis, we have to keep the mind that it's not only CAG, uh, even though it's uh, like implemented in almost all tools, but also Wiki pathways and Rectum. And uh, like this um, database contains an even uh, bigger amount of pathways, and, but they have like different data structure and you have to pre uh, prepare them for analysis. And for some analysis, you can uh, like prepare them with uh, a fight. It uh, quite, uh, works quite, quite well and you can, it can process uh, the people's ways and react on. And with cake, it's kind of a, a, a bit um, problematically to download it uh, from the website. You have to have reg registration and so on. And actually, last time when it uh, applied for this, uh, uh, for, 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 for uh, pathway licensing, we haven't obtained uh, our later. Better and we just used uh, R and R it's already implemented and you can like, use it directly uh, from R. And when you have different pathways, uh, first thing which uh, like, uh, pop up is to combine them. And it's already was done by pathway Fortin. And what you guys did, uh, they uh, did uh, it into like uh, ways. Uh, one, one way was just to find uh, uh, similar gene sets, maybe gene sets which are uh, fully overlapped, non fully overlapped, and you can combine like uh, super pathways when everything is overlapped and everything is fine. Probably it's most reliable pathways. Then you can uh, like, find some pathways with, uh, which have their analogs and to, to do some uh, sort of merging for them. And also, you can uh, resolve uh, connections and directions between uh, genes in your pathway, and it's like uh, the best thing, but it's, uh, it's, it's difficult to, to, to do this because it's not always uh, like, uh, feasible to understand how your weights and direction can be changed, especially when you're adding uh, some things into your pathway. But the world was done and uh, it was generated like a task uh, data, database. And so now you can, you're, you're having an additional database which are combining all, uh, all three previous. It consists almost of uh, 200, uh, 2,900 uh, pathways, and like mainly from rectum, but also like uh, keg and wiki pathways there. And so, so there are some uh, subsets, uh, uh, and the world only 26 uh, pathways were completely overlapped uh, between uh, three databases. And if you are using uh, all these uh, four, now it's four databases, like uh, one generic database and plus. Uh, you can see that uh, it's not always uh, affect uh, performance uh, performances and models uh, drastically, but sometimes it affects. And uh, what's interesting, it also depends on data set. So you have uh, like uh, tool, tool uh, variability, data set variability, and also pathway and database variability resources. And uh, probably you would like to investigate all of them uh, while you're when you're working with your data. Because there are no like clear answer which one is better, uh, especially uh, when you're talking for, for, about databases. And what was interesting uh, from the, uh, the like observation of the article, 
uh, there uh, was uh, like huge uh, amount of inconsistency when uh, some um, pathways, uh, some pathway databases uh, uh, gives your result of up regulation and another one for the same sample of down regulation of the pathway or somewhere like significantly affected and another one non significantly affected. And also, it was uh, not uh, only like for you know, pathway analysis, which preserves. Uh, topology but also for GCA and aura uh, we can observe inconsistency in results uh, between different pathway databases and as we remember GCA was uh, most like uh, uh, precise thing uh, it, I mean it, 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 it was it had the least number of uh, false positives and probably if if you if, if you even GCA uh, showed the uh, inconsistent result probably they are there and like uh, this uh, pathway has different composition of genes and it affects everything. So uh, it's it's there, there will not be a, like easy answer for you when you perform analysis on C pathways databases. You have to be ready for this. That is there will be like some inconsistency and probably it will not be like uh, maybe it's not even even be possible or feasible to understand uh, which is better, and we just have to. Uh, keep keep all the answers and try to understand. Maybe we, we will have to filter out inconsistent results and uh, save only like a coherent one, but it's not always um, uh, will, will provide you to a, lo a lot of data and you will filter out a lot of pathways. And um, speaking about GCA, one of the most uh, like. Uh, 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 it's it's not most precise thing. It's like most conservative thing I have to say. So it's it will not provide you a lot of uh, pathways, but uh, all pathways which it will provide you, they will be reliable. Um, how it works? Say you calculate uh, gene, uh, differential expression, and actually, it's a tricky thing when you're working with GCA. It's uh, well suitable for tasks uh, like when you have patients uh, and many groups of patients, uh, like um, to many patients in each group, for example, like 10 in uh, control, 10 in pathology. But when you're working for something like a drug uh, treatments, when you have like only three replicates per one drug, uh, it will be not so easy to do. Uh, because GCA, when it performs uh, uh, own um, like adjustment and significance testing, it uh, do permutation of labels of data, but it, like um, it's, it's a bit uh, worse per performed when you are uh, using uh, per permutation of uh, gene names because you are disrupting uh, intergene correlation. Um, but still, it works uh, even with perturbation, and when you have like duplicates. And that's it. You can uh, you, you 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 can uh, start meaningful information, but uh, maybe you would like to use uh, like additional constraints. For example, you can uh, combine FOSSA and gauge, uh, which uh, like works with p-value more heavily, and it will provide you like smaller amount of pathways, but they will be more relevant. And uh, a bit about how GCA works. Um, you are performing diff uh, different differential expression. Some genes will be upregulated, some will be downregulated, uh, some will be like unaffected. And you perform ranking from the like uh, like most uh, affected genes uh, from from the most upregulated to like, uh, most up downregulated. And uh, for like GCA, you have to uh, to have a gene set. Uh, basically, it's just uh, some uh, list of uh, genes. You can download it uh, from GCA, or you can generate it by yourself. Sometimes you have some gene of, uh, set of genes, and you want to analyze it. Uh, from which process is consistent, so on. So you have uh, this uh, gene set, and you are uh, running it. Uh, you are calculating running some. So um, if a gene occurs in your uh, gene set, uh, running some increased. If uh, there are like a gap, it will be decreased. And while it's uh, while this analysis is going, and your initial score increases. Um, while well, in most dense regions, and then it decreases uh, when you don't see genes from your gene set. And basically, you normalizing then this uh, score by a divide, division on the overall number of uh, genes in gene set, and you can calculate 
you value your over and overall understand your, your pathway up regulated down regulated and if it's if it's affected uh, at all and you have uh, like a huge number of subsets here and in every disk category you can like for example, for 2C5, you see there are like subcategories, and uh, it's not, not an easy choice to like select uh, one for like, for you. So probably it's better to to to, to, to understand uh, what are you investigated and which uh, like um, effects you're expecting from your perturbations or from in, in your like uh, disease uh, condition. It's like a typical uh, output of, from GCA uh, when you have like uh, uh, normalized and rich scores and you have uh, adjusted p value for them. And uh, adjusted p value is also not so like uh, obvious thing because uh, when we are calculating uh, adjusted p value for multiple hypothesis testing, we assume uh, that uh, our uh, like tests uh, they are independent, but they are not always independent, especially in pathways when you have like shared genes and uh, when you have connected pathways and uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's 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 like technique which are which are used, but uh, you have to keep in mind uh, this stuff that you actually your like testing tests they are not uh, completely independent. Uh, and another uh, tool uh, which was uh, which performed quite well it was SPA signaling for the impact analysis and why this tool uh, matters uh, it um, because it preserves uh, connections and directions between uh, genes and even sometimes when you have uh, small um, like effects in your genes. Uh, it could lead to uh, like drastic uh, or at least significant uh, perturbation of assay. What do I mean? For example, we have like uh, the same uh, pathway, and in one sample we have significantly affected, affected B and A genes, and another we have B and A genes affected. And what we can see uh, that F gene is like leaf gene. It's, it doesn't have uh, like any downstream genes. Uh, and so it's uh, there are no signal propagation, and a gene it's like an entry point uh, gene in the uh, pathway, so it affects every gene. And even though uh, for a, a, a gene we have like one point five uh, full change, and for a gene we have four four change, yes. Uh, and overall perturbation is higher in like left um, uh, case. Uh, significance will be higher in right case. Uh, because um, we have uh, like a bigger uh, amount of uh, accumulated changes uh, in uh, perturbation in our uh, pathway. And this, that's why it's quite sensitive as, as I think, uh, to work, uh, especially when you're working with something which affects uh, strongly uh, your like, phenotype, maybe some transcriptor factors or something like this, which uh, has like low expression or which like, hard to like, um, dysregulate uh, significantly. That's why SPA matters and better to, to try to implement it in uh, your researches. And uh, it, it, it has also different metrics for significance detection. Uh, overall, it's combination between a number of uh, like, uh, disrupted genes and uh, dysregulated yes and uh, uh, per, uh, overall uh, perturbation accumulation uh, and uh, you, you can see that uh, areas here like uh, one two three and five uh, they mean that you have uh, statistically uh, significantly affected uh, pathways the numbers here it's pathways and uh, blue and uh, red lines is different uh, uh, like thresholds after uh, multiple hypothesis test and correction, it's uh, FDR uh, blue one and red is one chromic correction. But overall, we have to keep in mind uh, this like uh, overall uh, dependency sync in between some pathways in all of the data sets and pathway databases. Uh, another good tool, uh, which kind of uh, is more about uh, unsupervised learning, is VGCNA, Better Genomic Correlation Network Analysis. 
and it's widely used and it's a good reason for it. You, when you are using a stuff like this, uh, you can try to find some models uh, which will not be biased by the previous uh, phase ways. And as you we have seen before, phase ways can have like inconsistent information. So, uh, so uh, VGCNA quite good uh, in, in, in these terms. And in VGCNA, we have like uh, many samples and uh, uh, gene expression for many samples ordered in a huge matches. And we are looking for correlation between genes. So we have multiple uh, like uh, observations for every gene and we are looking for correlation between them. Uh, then we can uh, like check, uh, also we can, we, we can check uh, correlation between uh, these genes and also try it if it is there of all between log P. Uh, overall, uh, we, we are using uh, like uh, absolute values of correlations, so like, we, we, we don't take into account plus or minus correlation. Maybe it's not so good thing because we are using directions of our in our network, but still we preserve uh, like all connections, and it's kind of a good thing. So, uh, it, and about correlation coefficients in. Uh, in the article, uh, also wrote that they implemented uh, Spearman and Kendall Dow, but overall, um, in the forum they wrote that actually with like uh, from some time and experience they have seen that it doesn't work quite well, and they like just recommend to use uh, Pearson or to use um, just a, a before correlation from the from the original article. Uh, actually, and also you have to. They don't recommend to use differential expression data. Yes, this is the case when we are using like uh, on just normalized data, normalized data, and uh, valence normalization, which are the performing, is also like uh, uh, it could affect your pathway performance. So better just to to start from like a default one, valence normalization. Uh, so when we like have our genes, we perform like all this valence. In, uh, uh, normalization, we have a correlative correlation. We are building adjusted semantics, which are like just a correlate, uh, correlation in uh, some power, uh, which we can uh, calculate, we can extract from our data. Uh, I mean, uh, data uh, in, the, in the analysis. Then, and also, what significant thing to keep in mind, we have to, to, to be sure that our like, topology is scale free and we have to build it. So, basically, when we uh, have built adjusted semantics, uh, we are performing clustering. And from, cl from clusterings, clusters uh, combining k means and uh, hierarchical clustering, we can extract models. And then those models is like actually the essence of the analysis, uh, like or maybe some hanging uh, fruit. Will hang in proof, uh, which uh, uh, can can be then analyzed with some GCAE or like another tools, so or you can send it uh, to Cytoscape and see uh, which pathways were affected and uh, genes in this pathway, maybe uh, some like clusters of genes. And also, um, uh, important thing about uh, VGCNA, you can find uh, most connected genes in every cluster. Uh, they are on the fingers of uh, um, MDS uh, analysis. You can find them, and these genes which are more, uh, most connected to this, uh, in your pathway. So probably, if you want to affect some pathway, you can uh, start from these uh, genes. And um, yeah, oh, it's, it's, it, actually, actually, that's it. And uh, as you may see, uh, sometimes um, with the first running uh, of this cytoscape analysis or something else. You can see that not, not not such a huge number of genes are affected in um, those ways. So maybe your models they has like some uh, biological meaning, and maybe maybe also like starting some those ways. So uh, some some sometimes better to uh, like save them and to compare different experiments and different uh, like samples, not, but different experiments and their model between themselves. And it can like provide you good information on you can or you can save this model like uh, gene set and you can uh, then use it further um, like for GCA or some other tool. So it's like um, some model relevant to your data, and probably you just want to save. And 
if we to go in first in evolution of the nurses, uh, obviously we want to pay attention to GSAE. It's an encoder uh, which has embedded gene sets. Uh, so basic input layer is your like, genes of the like, CPM or differential gene expression. Uh, and you have like a second layer, uh, you, you, you have gene sets. So as you may see, it's not fully connected. It has like uh, just uh, a, a relevant uh, genes connected to it. Uh, and it's, it's called gene sets. And then you can combine these gene sets and super set, uh, super set uh, like in latent layer. Uh, maybe I don't know. You would like to use like some additional layers, or maybe just some residual connections. Doesn't matter. Now we are talking about uh, super supplement layers, and overall the super supplement layers uh, they keep uh, information quite well, and you can compress your data quite good uh, in this way. So uh, if to calculate uh, compression uh, from this uh, two hundred supersets. Uh, you can see that overall information loss is not so huge. Uh, maybe you know, it's kind of big for down index, for, but for other indexes, it's not so huge. And if you will look on uh, Disney graphs, uh, they look uh, like reasonable. And different um, cancer types, cancer types, they have their own color. And we can see that uh, overall form uh, and the distances, they are quite close. So pro 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 probably it's a good method to like, for dimensionality reduction because when you have like twenty thousand uh, twenty thousand genes, uh, it's quite tricky thing to work with them and to understand uh, what is uh, the. And another good approach uh, is like um, neural networks. Uh, you can um, compress your data into open space and then you can work with open space and gene sets. And try extract some data from the, from uh, from them. Uh, basically, you can uh, do this also with postways. Uh, uh, and there are like approaches when you like incorporate your postways in your latent space. And you can uh, better uh, for your like task better to start from different uh, like autoencoders. At least from like the noise autoencoders, they like, shows uh, quite good results. Uh, for pathways, uh, like you, you will find more pathways in your latent space with them, uh, and also with variational autoencoders. Um, but if you will combine different um, like models and different approaches, you can combine their multiple latent spaces, and these multiple latent spaces they also contain a lot of information, and actually it's uh, they can they can gather even more information. Uh, if because um, some other matches they uh, has their pros and cons, uh, so uh, auto encoders is kind of looks like a next step in uh, pathway analysis, and we have to move move to them. Uh, but uh, it's not always easy to interpret this uh, latent spaces, uh, and some uh, we have to be careful and about like some sort of overfitting and so on, and. Uh, Actually, they requires uh, quite a lot of data uh, if to compare for, uh, with previous uh, like examples. But uh, still, we have this data. We have a lot of uh, mystic data in databases. Uh, the only thing they are generated with different instruments, different batches, and probably you would like to add this information uh, to your like latent spaces, maybe to condition uh, it uh, by uh, this data that are like. Uh, there are articles which uh, like implemented some uh, such approaches, and uh, they show that uh, overall results like uh, kind of good. And also, we have to understand that uh, for some uh, like features, it will be enough just uh, simpler uh, like one Latin space and one message. And for another features, we would like to use a full like battery of uh, uh, methods and Latin spaces and. It probably it's a bit more um, um, like more complicated uh, states or features, and uh, we would like to like extract all minor uh, information and minor uh, like factors, but we have to be careful uh, with uh, like additional noise and overall signal stimulation. Okay, uh, so that's it. Thank you for your attention. I hope uh, it was more or less clear. Thank you, Dimitro. It's actually time for questions. Thank you for your speech. It's been great. So let's go for our questions. The first one we have here is 
first one is what what is criteria to select pathway database um sorry what is criteria to select pathway database reference or shall we include all available yeah it's actually it's a tricky thing uh and there are no simple answer uh, probably you would like to start from uh only one uh, but uh when you like perform some sort of analysis you have to move first or maybe you not have to but you would like to just in order to see but the, you have to be like brave and be ready that there will be a lot of inconsistency and there will be no simple answers uh, that's why like my answer will be to use like all of them but to be ready to for pain with this mental pain to be ready for pain is a good answer um the another question is we have all heard about the recent high profile first round investment of 3 billion in Altus Labs. What is your opinion? Does the technology have a future and when we can expect rejuvenation technology and profound reversal of diseases like Alzheimer's for the masses? Uh, actually, can you repeat because I missed the start of the question? Sure. Uh, there was the recent high profile first round investment of three billion dollars ah, yeah. in Altus Labs. So what's yeah. your opinion? Like if the technology is ready. Uh, yeah, actually they're working with epigenetic uh, like reprogramming and it seems like a good thing. Uh, from my experience, there are a lot of inconsistency too in epigenetic reprogramming and uh, we like kind of did some uh, researches and this biological age, it's not always uh, so close, especially for mice but for human too, which calculated by the genetic program. But there were a lot of articles, uh, which like inspiring articles and probably it will work. And for me, it's like, uh, it looks like one of the like, best uh, directions of anti-agent medicine. When it will be ready, it's hard to say. It's definitely not ready. Uh, we don't have good uh, like uh, approaches to reprogramming, especially like full organizing. We can reprogram cells. It's very quite uh, like easy procedure. And uh, but to uh, like rejuvenate full organism, it's not so easy. Uh, even though, like, well, there were like some uh, uh, experiments and kind of successful. Oh, but do you think that this kind of investment can pay off in some, I don't know, five to ten years mm. period? It's 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 a difficult question because we don't know how this investment spread. If they have like few like uh, good experiments and they are like working with them, uh, probably yes. If like they spread it to like big amount experiments, it's maybe maybe no. Because actually, uh, I guess um, when we when we are talking about emergency program, there are also a lot of white white spots, and it's not always easy to do it uh, like precisely and to tune it easily. And they're like, uh, they, have, they have to overcome it a lot of uh, obstacles, I guess. I, ho I hope they will do it uh, fast, but uh, I, it's, it's hard to believe that it will be fast. Okay, I understand. Thank you a lot for your answers. We have to move further to our last speaker for today. It's Alexander Hurbic, who is the CEO founder at Blackthorn AI. And he's going to talk about cutting edge drug discovery where your game changer AI project will fail. So, Alex. Hello, everybody. Yeah, you can start presenting then. Thank I'm you. I'm sharing my screen. Do you see it? Yes. Okay, I'll start. So uh, today's talk uh, will be dedicated uh, to the uh, modern hype, a problem of uh, drug discovery, um, drug discovery R&D, first of all, um, and cutting edge technologies. <coughs> uh, and the hype led that uh, many people uh, started to build their startups. And today I will talk about why your game changer uh, will fail. First of all, we have to quickly get the landscape, and this is the drug 
discovery process in front of you. It starts from target validation, where we're finding appropriate target for our new prospective drug. Then we screen compounds, optimize compounds, do preclinical testing on cells, and then three phases of um, studies on people. And then if uh, the third phase is successful, the drug uh, is approved after some time and then uh, can be repurposed to market. <laughs> so uh, usually delivery of uh, one drug to market uh, takes 15 years, like from 12 to 18. And uh, today's cost um, average is uh, $2.6 billion. But it is expected that drug discovery market will grow exponentially and uh, its size will be 71 billion in uh, 2025. Uh, according to the previous picture, the overall clinical trials uh, failure rate is 90%. It means um, only 10% of um, compounds which uh, end the phase three and was not filtered earlier, only 10% of them uh, come to market. So it is um, incredibly high failure rate. Nowadays, only 12% of uh, pharmaceutical and biotech companies use AI technologies. Uh, it means they are not widely adopted yet. Moreover, we have um, 150 drugs delivered with AI assistance uh, on these stages, like three early stages. And we have 15 drugs which were designed with AI in clinical trial stages. Uh, it means phase one, phase two, phase three. And what conclusions can we do? Uh, is that we are at the dawn of a new era in drug discovery. It is obvious. Then AI in drug discovery gives real results. And when I say real results, it means therapeutic molecules. But enterprises are slow due to operational overload and they cannot innovate quickly. That's a typical problem of all enterprises. They have like directors of directors and then directors of directors. Then they have senior directors, um, vice presidents, uh, presidents, head of departments and all that shit, I apologize, it makes the corporate terribly slow. So it never um, over compete smaller companies. So right now uh, is the time of small and fast startups. Later, usually startups uh, will be bought and integrated by enterprises. And as usually they often fail to integrate them, but this is a different story. So what are we going to talk about today? We will talk about four deadly scenes of AI projects in drug discovery. First is hype. Second, incompetent directors. Third, loud names and low quality technologies. And fourth is bad data. First, chapter number one, hype. Um, almost everybody, um, each one of you heard things like AI is the game changer, AI is the future, AI like will solve everything. Like let's take this data, put it into the neural network, it will do the trick. Or let's add AI in the pipeline and uh, it will solve your problem. Like it, so, and uh, companies uh, which claim themselves to be like AI powered, uh, get investments fast because people are very um, expired um, with uh, like new fancy technologies. But um, uh, the reality, uh, the reality is that uh, is not that good. Um, Never be like, uh, oh, uh, like don't don't uh, cheat yourself. AI uh, is uh, just a tool. Uh, AI has limited uh, applicability. It uh, takes years to master uh, this tool. It's like you, um, 
after after these years, you know where to apply it and where you shouldn't apply it. What can it do and what it can't. And uh, moreover, uh, AI is limited by environment and uh, limited by data. So 90% of success in any AI project is, um, is data. It depends on the quality, quantity, and data preparation and feature engineering. Without that, um, I would say that it will be impossible to uh, succeed in any project. So chapter number two is incompetent directors. Um, here is a bit uh, complicated picture, but uh, it uh, mirrors the typical structure uh, of enterprise or, or how a new idea or project or venture is deployed. Uh, first of all, a CEO uh, or any like major executive has an idea. CEO has an idea because he like spent like 10, 20, 30 years in the field. He knows all the intricacies, all ins and outs and see opportunity. So having seen the opportunity, he generates the idea how this problem can be addressed. Yeah, and it, okay, he see the opportunity, but typically uh, those executives, they simply, they understand, they understand the matter, they understand the technology, they understand the limitations, um, the needs, the market, they have like, they understand all of it, but <clears throat> they don't have time to manage it. They don't have time to sit and implement. They even don't have time to manage the tech team or other teams because it, they're simply overwhelmed with, uh, uh, with activities. So that's how they decide to hire directors a set of directors to whom uh, the CEO's responsibility of the implementation of the idea will be delegated. And uh, this is how these uh, technical directors are hired. This is oversimplified picture, but um, it shows you the essence uh, of issue. So, uh, so here are hired directors. We hired uh, our technical director, we hired sales director and we hired science director. So science director will be responsible for uh, scientific part, like for chemistry, biology, pharmaceutics, um, physics, um, all the stuff uh, which is needed from the domain point of view. Uh, of course, and, and it is typically that biologists and chemists they are not uh, good coders. So this uh, science, uh, and as well, they don't have appropriate education. They don't know like a commit practices. They don't know um, how the code must be organized, uh, how you do web, what is the backend, front end, uh, what is the three layer architecture, multi tunnel architecture, what are the pros and cons and stuff. Nobody expects from them that uh, deep knowledge of these matters. So a second director is hired, and this is a technical director. This technical director came from a pure software, typically again, uh, from a pure software development environment. He knows how to manage small teams, big teams, uh, multiple teams. Mm, he knows when you should uh, choose Python, when Java, uh, what architecture uh, and stuff. Um, he's he will he he've been through all the career ladder like started from junior engineer and senior architect and now he is a technical director capable both of uh, managing software development teams and has some solid understanding of technologies um and then of course we have to sell our product so we hire sales uh, director who is responsible for promotion marketing and sales team uh, now all these people, and it is generally thought that this set of people, they can cover all the areas which are needed and to successfully deliver the product of which a CEO had an idea. But all parts are good and all parts can do their job. But when it comes to the interaction, 
science director, for example, given questions to which he simply doesn't know how to answer. For example, technical director, he has no idea what are the structure of proteins, how they are stored, for example, what is smiles, what are smarts, when you use that, when you use extended fingerprints, when you use neural fingerprints, he has no idea, no bad idea of that. But he wants to know how to store them, for example, because he wants to choose the database, right? So he goes to a science director and asks him, hey, I need to build a data model, right, to store our data. Is our data structured or unstructured? And science director responds, hey, we have PDB files. PDB files, okay. Technical director, not okay. He doesn't know what are PDB files, what are the structure, coordinates, what is the content and stuff, see? Um, so by essence, science director cannot assist and cannot interact efficiently with the technical director because he doesn't know basics of computer science. He doesn't know what is the transactional database, uh, what is the analytical database, should their schema be Inman like a Kimball. He just, um, he, his mind get, gets blank. He knows chemistry, he knows biology, yeah, right? Then technical director, as a result of a communication with a science director, he came out with no idea of what he is going to deliver, right? Uh, he, he got a lot of information like, okay, we have to take into account diastereomers and tautomers, but what is it? He has no bare understanding, right? While these words are very familiar for science directors, this is some abracadabra for technical director. And it remains such. So they had a conversation. Now we forgot about the third director. It's a sales director. He has to sell something, right? Sales director is usually very active people. They uh, start to make a lot of calls and um, Emails, or cold, hot meetings, like uh, hitting doors on LinkedIn um, and stuff. Most likely and most often, they just reuse set of tools which they like familiar with. They take their old tools to the new job and they try, try to apply and try to sell the product. Okay, so everything was fine with sales until this time. The problem is that sales don't understand what he is going to sell. He doesn't understand what this thing does, who should he going to speak to with, about what, what is his uh, ideal customer profile and stuff. He doesn't know how it works. He doesn't know what the tool does. It all results in uh, many efforts spent uh, without any result. So imagine a sales director did like a thousand attempts uh, like to sell this month, but unfortunately they resulted in uh, zero pre-sales, like nothing, nobody interested because he even failed uh, to explain uh, uh, to his prospect <laughs> what this thing for. This is not a joke. Um, this is a real situation, by the way. Uh, like, hey, I heard there is a hype. Let me sell. Let me sell your stuff. Okay. Do you know what you're going to sell? No, you say me. Hmm, nice. <clears throat> so uh, we took into account only directors. And in my opinion, the error, the all failure of the system begins here because these people then tasked to uh, gather the teams that will do uh, low level tasks, right? And th they've been asked to do um, job description and hire, you hire five people, you hire four people, um, science director don't hire people, like you alone will do the trick. 
because he's just an advisor. <laughs> and uh, okay, hiring people, doing job description is fine. This is what they know how to do. And they do it in a month or two, they create job description, create teams. See, now the uh, technical director created under him development team and sales director created PR marketing and sales team under him. Did it help? Of course, no. Because these people initially didn't know what they are going to do. So they hired people. They gave them the tasks which sell told to them. As we know, sell gave them high level task, right? Which is um, macro management, macro management. You tell, I need um, a, a, a life science platform which stores this kind of data and does this kind of thing. This is a macro management. These instructions uh, were given to uh, directors, these directors. But since they don't have deep understanding of the matter, they failed to decompose these macro commands to micromanagement. So once they created their teams under them, now they have to explain to the teams what should they do. But the only thing that they can do is to retranslate the same macro task that they received from executives. See? So they expect like junior, middle, and senior engineers to understand on their own what must be done. Well, this is their task. Understand very deeply, decompose it to micro instructions, and then assign these micro instructions to um, to performance, right? It, it all end up that the infrastructure teams and the company is formally created, but since this crack in misunderstanding of people in different domains of what they should deliver, they fail to onboard and um, instruct their teams appropriately. So in a, like three, four, five, six months, the costs were spent, the salaries were paid, but where is the product? The product will be in exact same state as it was six months ago. More precisely, nowhere. See? So the teams sitting on their chairs and expecting, um, and this is their full right, they expect clear micro instructions. See, the task that they were given to abstract, they don't know what to do. They just sit and wait, maybe play some PUBG. Maybe talk to their like um, uh, friends, maybe scroll Facebook. This is what they do. Okay. Uh, now, it was a conceptual explanation, and now is a real story. A real story which happened exactly according to this scenario, and we observed it uh, in some uh, business communications. So the company idea was to create virtual drug development platform in precision medicine. Great idea. This is a good time for it. And um, if they do it properly and in time, they can uh, occupy a large part of a market because now it's not filled. There is a very small competition. This company started on March, uh, almost a half year ago. Uh, initial team included one CEO. He hired four directors and the directors, last time I spoke to them, they had two team members. So a total uh, six people in the team. Those team members also were seniors. So um, we will round it up and it will be six directors, yeah. Current project status, uh, after six months of work. MVP, no MVP. 
POC, no POC. Database schema, they didn't develop database schema. Detailed roadmap, they don't know what they're going to do step by step. Development team, part of the team were hired, but then they understood that they don't know what to do. So they even stopped hiring. And uh, I think that the set of people was inappropriate. They simply, the people they hired, they just, they cannot deliver the product they want. And now let's compute approximate uh, project investments. Uh, average director salary in the country where this um, company resides is about almost uh, 100,000 bucks uh, per year. So six uh, director level uh, people in six months got almost $300,000 uh, of salary and uh, excluding payroll taxes. So I expect the cost of the project, like as you see, the project is a big sarcasm here because they did nothing in a half a year. So they just wasted uh, 300,000 bucks, expect like around and wasted half a year. This is the real example of the situation uh, I just described. So what should you do to avoid with, with this issue? Simply remember two rules. If you're an expert in the both domain and technology, do it. If you are not expert, don't do it. Very simple. See, I mentioned Greg Landrum here because this is a brilliant example of a genius who, who was both competent in chemistry, like a god, and in software development. And he created amazing thing at the kit, which we all use and love. Chapter number three, loud names, low quality technologies. Loud names attract people, especially uh, U.S. citizens. They love hype. They love loud things. Um, they are all e very easily attracted to that. But first, uh, before the story, I have to give you a bit of a context. So let's make a step aside and talk about open source program for molecular docking. It's called Autodoc Vina. And it is very old. It was, was invented in Scripps Research Institute in 1989, more than 30 years ago. It was updated multiple times and uh, many people use it. And it is still pretty popular. Uh, it is fine, it is great achievement. I don't have anything like, against it. And for um, creating a pose of a molecule, it is sometimes works. But recently, about a year ago or a bit more, we were working on a study, uh, which uh, you can see here. It was published uh, in uh, Elsevier. Uh, the name is Assembling Machine Learning Models to Boost Molecular Affinity Prediction. We tried to use Autodoc Vina as a reference for our neural networks. And, and this is a link to a research. Uh, feel free to follow it. Uh, we tried to use Autodoc Vina as a, as a reference, as a baseline, you know, here is, here is what Vina predicts. And if we, we will do better, then most likely um, our tool is at least um, to some extent better than Vina. It will be some moderate success, but we need something to reference to. But when we took KMBL, uh, we took um, we wanted to test Vina uh, before use, right? We started to create a benchmark. Uh, we selected a set of compounds with known Ki. Ki is an inhibition constant. It is uh, used to describe um, a molecular um, binding affinity of a ligand to a receptor. The lower Ki, the stronger um, the association. Now let's take a look what is on this chart. Um, in, uh, in red, 
you see compounds that are non-binders. They do not bind with receptors. The, the, the binding affinity and the strength of association is too low. So they are non-active compounds. While the blue ones are binders. These are compound compounds that <clears throat> interact strongly with the receptor. Uh, do you see separation? No. There were no separation. It means that autodoc vena fails to predict molecular binding. Um, and feel free to read more about this case in the blog post. Here is a link to it. Now, <clears throat> let's finish this uh, step aside uh, context. Now you know a bit about autodoc vena. Let's get back to our scene number three, allowed names, low quality technologies. And let's consider an example. This is a, one of the many example. I don't talk about the rest. I'm, I picked only one, just as a very declarative. What is the issue? The issue is that people tend to follow famous researchers or institutions without deep understanding of the matter, methods, and results. So they see, um, in our case, we will consider a paper from uh, MIT. We all know that MIT is the top computer science university and research institution in the world. So if you see something from Cambridge, most likely it is good. <laughs> and this is the paper, Equibind. Um, it is very fresh. Uh, it is uh, 2022. Uh, it's geometric deep learning, one of the hottest uh, current topic in uh, <clears throat> drug discovery. Uh, here is the link uh, on the archive to, uh, to this um, publication. Um, briefly, the concept. Okay, so, so yeah, we have a like cool institution, top-notch researchers, great topic. Here is a technology. Uh, here is a ligand receptor. Um, they take a kit, creating a, a random conformer from a ligand, uh, then they somehow encode a receptor structure, put all of that into the neural network, graph neural network, and it gives you pose and conformation of this ligand on this receptor. It is called blind flexible docking. Blind, because we don't pick a location of a ligand on a surface of a receptor, the program gives it automatically. Flexible because initial uh, conformation um, of a ligand has been changed. It was optimized to fit uh, uh, the binding surface in a perfect manner, the best th that uh, we could uh, to geometrically optimize it. Great idea, great idea. Uh, so we have all the set of like hype world words. Um, we have geometric, deep learning, predicting structure, drug binding, all hype words we have. We have proof that it works. And here are the details. We become even more excited, wow. Cool technology, ligand, random conformer, a lot of math, see graphs, uh, information, message passing from node to node. Wow. Uh, even uh, looks like here we have here attention mechanism because we have information transferred between like receptor graph and ligand graph. See multi head attention, cool, top notch technology. And then we have final complex. Right? Exactly as we've been promised uh, in the short description. After this, we all want to build a startup. 
take this paper, re-implement the paper and make money. Except through specialists, because they don't only look at the pictures, they read the papers. And if we read the paper, actually, see, here is the table. So if we read it more precisely with more attention, we will understand that this equibind is just proposes us uncorrected, chemically unplausible molecules. It means chemical garbage. It throws everything at you. Then you have another thing that filters it. Okay, we don't use it. They thought, yes, this is wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong. Oh, this is fine. Good. So it throws chemical garbage, <clears throat> but not at receptor. What? It predicts approximate ligand position. So on the receptor surface, it simply predicts a point where it will locate its chemical garbage. And then, and now remember the context I gave you a little bit before about autodoc vena and that it fails to predict binding force, remember? So now they use autodoc vena for their chemical garbage outputs and expected approximate um, initial position of a ligand. So actually all the job, all the trick does existing uh, outsourcing like a freeware technology autodoc vena. Okay, this is the half of a disaster. Another half of a disaster is a precision with which they predict this initial point. It is plus minus eight angstrom. What is it, guys? Eight, eight angstrom is like maybe on this side, maybe on that side. Moreover, here is the um, one of the add-ons to Vina is called Smina. The Smina alone, without uh, there this huge ugly thing, without all these complications, it can do the same, exactly, the same blind docking, but with a precision like 12 angstroms. So all this stuff gives you only like four angstroms better. And to sum up what this thing does, it creates chemical garbage, throws it, uh, approximately into autodoc with average accuracy of 8.2 angstroms and it beats autodoc alone without this thing only by four angstrom. Okay, now you think that creating a startup using this open source code is maybe not that good idea and you're right. So congratulations, you've just got a level up, a professional level up and learned extremely useful lesson, do not trust anyone. Chapter number four, bad data. Actually all public um, biological data is bad, unfortunately. Why? First, because nobody shares good data, because this is a competitive advantage. So if you decided to implement your great idea on public data, be ready. So bad data destroys your PSC. Let's consider how. First, there are discrepancies between in silico, in vitro, in vivo and measurement environments. This one is very simple. In silico is emulation, is a model of the world. In vitro, 
uh, are experimental studies in model organism, mice, cells, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So model environment is an oversimplification of the world. Um, if you, if anybody familiar with the molecular dynamics, you know that you can do a study in a vacuum, in a water, or in any other solvent, right? This is a good approximation of a reality, but still, our blood, where all this, most of this interaction happens, is not water, is not other solvent, right? It's a biological solution of proteins, micro and macro elements, fats, sugars, a lot of stuff. It doesn't look like any modeled environment. So uh, interactions in the modeled environment and in our blood, which we want all the stuff to work, will be different. Same is actual for in vitro studies. Um, we know a lot of stuff that worked in cockroaches, but didn't work in people because they have you know, different uh, organisms, different bodies, different organs. Um, and the same is related to measurement environments. Measurement environments is place where we took our data. If we will think about the structure of proteins, there are a number of methods uh, for measurement of the structure. There are Raman spectroscopy, uh, there are NMR, uh, there are um, electronic microscopy, um, and uh, many more. But, uh, for example, Raman spectroscopy works with crystals. It can give you a structure of coordinates. Coordinates, uh, I mean, X, Y, Z, special 3D coordinates of atom in a substance. To create this structure, you need a crystal. Now let's think about how you measure a structure of amino acids. Before you do any measurements, you have to create a crystal. How you create a crystal? You have a solution of amino acids, and then you have to do something so that they become crystals. It means, uh, and there are a number of methods. First, you regulate the pH of a solution so that all molecules of amino acids become uncharged. So their total charge of every amino acid is, should be zero. Usually, it is achieved in an uh, acid, acid pH, something near 5.5. And then you lower the temperature and uh, then they all fall down uh, in the form of crystal. And then uh, you measure the, uh, the coordinates. Question for you. You have all this fancy stuff, receptor ligand, um, molecules, uh, ligands that stick to the surface of a receptor, experimentally measured data. Question for you, where they were measured in crystals. All of them are crystal measurements. Does it look like your body? No. Obviously, you're not a crystal, right? Your body is a liquid. Uh, your blood I mean, is a liquid. Uh, and more, its pH is not 5.5. If it is, like, I have bad news for you. What it means? It means the structures that are on that public database, like MoADB, um, binding DB, PDB, they are all skewed. They are crystals. Your blood, not a crystal. So thinking that the stuff binds in the same way as it was measured is a big, big approximation. Of course, we have a discrepancy and um, a space for errors. Um, okay, it was what related to discrepancies between in silico, in vitro, in vivo, and measurement environments. I explained you what is in silico, like modeling of environment. What is in vitro uh, is a study, um, experimental environment like cells or mice, and in vivo, which is actually a human body or target organism, um, target organism environment, and also how we measure that. 
how we measure the crystals and other stuff. Then uh, the measurement itself were carried out in different decades by different methods, different scientists and on different equipment. Um, I will talk about it in more details right now. Uh, for the historical consistency, I will tell you that there are also maybe human errors, like somebody broke the pill uh, and other things. Um, and also the nature is very complicated. We don't know. We don't know a full picture of nature, almost in, in any field. Every field is just approximation. Physics is approximation. Uh, biology, we know a part, right? But we still don't know where our consciousness comes from, for example, and who we are. So the nature itself is very complicated, and it is hard to describe it. And if you cannot describe it, you cannot parameterize it. And this is what we want to do. If we want to predict properties, we have to parameterize the objects that we are going to work with. And until we did that reliably, it is hard to expect any good results and we still fail. Having all that in mind, let's get back to different decades of measurements. A good example of a, a huge timeline of records is USPTO. USPTO is United States Patent and Trademark Office. It's a set of patent um, of US uh, office. Yeah. Here is a, it's a landing page. Uh, this database contains patents issued from uh, 1976 to the present in form of text and PDF images of all patents from uh, 1790 to present time. This, why I'm talking about this data set? Because this data set serves as a benchmark uh, for uh, predicting chemical yield uh, in case of a multi reaction class data set. It means your data set consists reactions that represent different mechanisms and different reaction classes. Cool? Cool. But who measured that? Can we expect that a, a 30 years experience a professor working in the lab does experiments with the same accuracy that his Chinese colleague that just arrived from, um, I don't know, some a few weeks ago? No, maybe he did some mistakes. And there are thousands of that. We don't know how people work. We don't know their methods. So all of that results in the best public result on this data set to be R square of 0 0.388. It is below 0 0.5. It is unreliable. People did a lot of studies, a lot of models, tried to do this and that and generate features and neural networks and fat neural networks and birds and graphs and all the stuff. <coughs> and all of that didn't help. We tried to repeat it. Here is our recent publication uh, of uh, which is called Advancing Molecular Graphs. So we took molecular graphs, uh, parameters, parameterized atoms and bonds, and added some chemical descriptors to them, hoping to extend the picture of the world for the model. So it gets more information, and it is capable of pre better prediction of yield. And here is the conceptual scheme of the model. And uh, it didn't work on USPTO. It worked on other data sets that were more carefully selected, but on USPTO, it didn't work. We didn't get better results. What it says? It says that the data itself is noisy, dirty. And whatever the module you take, it will not give you good results because this is not the problem of the model. <clears throat> so conclusions, high quality data is always almost private. 
nobody will share will share good data with you as i told you before this is because this is a competitive advantage second conclusion public data is almost always crap except the cases where kind-hearted researchers really did a good job and shared with people for the future of mankind there are such people big respect to them uh, what should you do get your own lab do experiments have a one team one equipment one methods and uh, consistent measurements and be happy because science is fun um, it concludes my report for today. Uh, the last um, thing I wanted to say is that we have to repeat uh, 1812, please. Now, time for questions. Alex, thank you for your speech. So, the main question is actually about the data. Is there any chance or any way to get better data, more? quality data to at least uh, running an experiment and to get something above the R square zero five. On USPTO? Yeah. Um, we, you can try to split it, uh, to do data stratification, split it into uh, one reaction mechanism. First of all, there will be hundreds of classes and then within each classes, try to separate clusters and uh, do your prediction on, uh, on these clusters rather than on all data. Uh, you will end up with uh, like hundreds of models, but I see this as the only way. Okay, I understand. And is there any, from your practice, is there any um, data you have uh, used that are reliable, uh, like from the public data? Uh, we know that the PDB data set is uh, more or less reliable. Uh, the core set, there are, they did a very good job <clears throat> by doing extended data set, then a, a core and um, multiple refined sets, and you can find uh, what you need. And it serves nowadays as a baseline for different um, biologically related um, researches. Okay, thank you for the answer. And the last question is, what is your take on visualization tools used for clustering genomics data? The question is from um, Shakya. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. Um, I, think, I think Dimitro is uh, the person who can advise you. Ah, yeah. We, yeah. Oh, apologies. Um, yeah, I think it is dependent on the, on the task you're doing. Because if you're doing like uh, up-down regulation of genes, for example, then this is one visualization. If you're trying to build a sequence of mechanisms, this is another visualization. Yeah, but we know the tools uh, for these cases. Um, what are the tools? Do they make, make sense? Um, so, as I saw, they, they work fine on the data set they've been uh, created on. It's a sync, as far as I know. L, 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 L1000. Ah, CAG. It's a CAG data set. And they don't work on others. <laughs> They don't generalize because they are built on a, a bit primitive technology like PCA under the hood and some K-means clustering that disappointed me. Okay, so I hope it answers the question. The tool uh, is called VGCNA. Or and the Ronto tools. Well, basically, this tool just extracts information, yeah, but and visualization can be di different. Uh, and yeah, you're right, it's basically the best way if you want to perform positive visualization to do it like with some cake pathways, it just works better with it. Uh, but uh, and if you want just to visualize your data just after complexity reduction, TSNI kind of works, but uh, oh, it works, it works okay. Uh, it's not the best way, but it's like 
but maybe it's the best way it's not the perfect way you know if you if you have if you want to, to do like quick view and like uh, complex data reduction to perform the task and as some of the encoders probably has to provide quite good results like this this Latin space and you can you can try it too uh, I think that this question is to Alec could you spell the tool name once again Dutro, please help us. You are like more familiar with this. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm not ready right now to, to establish tool you can use to visualize uh, like uh, pathways uh, and affect affected pathways. Actually, uh, site escape you can use to like uh, when you are working with gene sets, uh, for example, this model is generated by VGCNA. Uh, and, you, you, and it's quite easy. You, it has like website. It's like Cyto C Y T O and Scape. Can like you S can you type it in the chat, please? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll type it. Thank you. Okay, so I'll, I'll post it to the YouTube directly. Thank you for the question. Okay, um, we're pretty off the schedule, but it's been a great actually three hours. I uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Dimitra, for answering last questions. We will add all the contacts and uh, links to presentations. Uh, we will add that, them to the video description on YouTube. So you'll be able to check that. If you have any questions, you'll be able to write a direct email to the speaker and hopefully get your answer. So thank you all. It's been a pleasure. And I hope to see you on a on our next event, which we will plan and inform through our LinkedIn and even Bright account. All Thank the you, best. Mike. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. -bye.